Hello, I am Carmen Boyosa. And I'm Samantha Schnee. And here we are because we are going to offer you a three course meal. We were the intro. And it is about the Book of Eve, Carmen's 20th novel, which will be published by Deep Vellum in May 2023. Next comes come the first course. The first course is a reading, a portion of the book. That's the version of Eve, her version of her story. Very different from the one we know. We are going to have the reading by Maria Aura. Then you are going to have the staging. It's going to be staged by Alonso Barrera. And the photographer, the photographer, you have here his credit. Okay. Remuevo el agua del estanque para iluminar mi noche. No me acerco al panal. Me alejo tanto de él como de Adán. Pero los tengo a la vista. Estoy de pie. Contemplo el cielo. Veo las altas paredes de piedra cercándome, protegiéndonos. Recojo del suelo un pedrusquillo y lo aviento al estanque. El agua salpica sus estrellas, tan distintas y tan iguales a los brillos del cielo. Sigo de pie. Saco, como he hecho a menudo, la semilla que recogí del árbol de la fruta deliciosa del Edén. Vive entre los bien enredados vellos de mi axila. Veo de nuevo al cielo. Rozo mis labios con la semilla lisa. Los vuelvo a rozar. Sigo de pie. Estoy viendo el cielo. No sé por qué me llevo la semilla a la boca y con mi propia saliva me la trago. Cierro los ojos. Siento cómo la semilla se desliza silenciosa por mis tripas. Primero en un avance tímido, cauteloso, hasta que el cercano sonar de mi corazón se espabila. Entonces, más que por la inercia de la gravedad, convertida en algo más veloz que lo que vive adentro de un cuerpo, sideral, entre que alegrada por el tambor interno, alentada por el paso de la sangre y el acto de reflexión impulsiva del hígado, percibo el vértigo en que navega la semilla adentro de mí sin desviarse hacia mi trasero para reunirse con los desechos que salen por atrás. La pequeña llega al trecho inferior interior de mi tronco, el que tengo entre mis dos piernas y que es como un callejón sin fondo, con solo un ducto para la salida de la orina. Pero esta semilla... No viaja por donde va la orina. Está por la libre. Está en mi cuerpo. Va en lo suyo que es lo mío. Siento que me golpea de adentro de mí hacia afuera. Siento que se me clava. Que casi se me sale. No consigue salir. La retiene el puentecillo que es la base de mi tronco. Y entonces la semilla sube de nuevo. Regresa sobre sus pasos. Me llega al centro del pecho. Respiro hondo. El aire que he tomado es aspirado por la semilla y ella toma vuelo. Ahora sí cae con fuerza, ahí, en el puentecillo entre mis piernas. Es tal su impacto esta vez, tal su fuerte golpe con su dulce punta que me abre ahí, entre las dos piernas, una segunda boca. Un par de labios me brotan como se abre una flor entre las piernas. Piernas que tocan la tierra. Parecería, les dice la semilla, como hablándoles con esa boca que me acaba de salir. Estén atentas. Se me doblan las piernas, me acuclillo, y en el centro de esa boca nueva florece el clítoris. El placer vivo de la manzana, rompiendo, abriendo mi piel. Un trecho de carne viva, sensible, conocedora de la cercanía del corazón, palpadora de la sangre, percepción de la gravedad terrestre, un algo como crocante, aunque suave, que lleva la palabra y el recuerdo intenso del placer que sentí al morder la fruta, y que lleva también la conciencia, y lleva más, aún más. Me llevé la mano al clítoris. Aquella mordida original que crujió en mis dientes y alteró nuestra vida, me tenía reservado un gusto supremo en esa pequeña semilla negra. 34. Clítoris, manzana, fuego, semilla. Las comparaciones son limitadas, pero van tres. Una tiene que ver con la manzana. Dicen que yo di a probar la manzana a Adán. Si lo doy por cierto, como estoy haciendo, 
sabremos sin dudar que Adán sintió algo parecido a lo que sentí yo, aunque con menor intensidad. Lo suyo no fue menor, pero le llegó atenuado, degradado. El suyo fue un placer no comparable al mío. La segunda, con el fuego, que me provocó en el brazo del bello ángel que ansié tener y que obtuve y que nos dio la luz en la noche, el ancla para impedir la tormenta del miedo nocturno, la protección contra las fieras. A Adán no se le hubiera ocurrido robarlo o coquetearle. La tercera, con la semilla que la manzana me dejó. Alerta a lo que la semilla de la manzana me había dejado, abierta mi persona al clítoris, gocé tocándomelo. Adán despertó y supo que algo había en mí nuevo. Yo me tocaba aún el clítoris en éxtasis. Adán agitó el agua del estanque luminoso para verme mejor. Me observó fríamente, escrutándome. Tal vez recordó la manzana. Lo que sé es que quiso, quiso tener lo que yo tenía. No sabía cómo lo había yo obtenido, así que hizo su intento básico. Quitó mi mano de mi clítoris y se la puso entre sus piernas. Pero entre sus piernas no había nada. No sintió nada. Regresé mi mano a mí. No solo esa noche. Yo me tocaba el clítoris muy seguido. El placer estaba siempre ahí, esperándome. Adán quería imitarme. Quería tener lo que yo tenía. Ya había visto que no era mi mano quien daba lo que yo sentía. Así que probó con las suyas. Y siguió probando. Empecinado, frotó y frotó. Y siguió frotándose el doblez por ratos con ayuda de otros objetos, pero él no obtenía esa delicia que me había sido dada por la semilla de la fruta deliciosa, encarnada en mí de adentro de mi cuerpo a mi exterior. De tanto frotar, Adán se produjo un doblez en la piel que mediara entre sus piernas. From the Book of Eve by Carmen Bollosa 33 The Seed of Paradise When I awaken, Troubled by my dream, I need to take a walk. Adam sleeps, muttering something or other. I stare the waters of the pond to illuminate the night. I don't go near the beehive. I move as far away from it as I do from Adam, keeping them both in my sight. I'm standing, contemplating the sky. I see the high walls of stone surrounding me, protecting us. I pick a small stone off the ground and throw it into the pond. The water is sprinkled with stars, so different from and so similar to the brightness in the heavens. I'm still standing, as I often do. I remove the apple seed, the one I took from the tree with the delicious fruit in Eden, which I keep in the thick hair that grows under my arm. I look at the sky once more. I brush the smooth seed against my lips and do it again. I'm still standing, looking at the sky. I don't know why I put the seed in my mouth and swallow it with my saliva. I close my eyes. I feel the seed move silently through me, timidly at first, cautious, until the nearby sound of my heart enlivens it. Then, due to inertia more than gravity, it becomes astral, faster than anything inside a body, animated by my internal beat, spurred on by the movement of my blood and the humors of my liver. I notice the vertigo with which it moves through me. It avoids the waste excreted through my rear, The tiny thing travels all the way to the lowest part of my thorax, the place between my legs, which is like an endless passage that has only one exit for urine. But the seed doesn't take the exit. It's moving freely inside my body. And what is mine belongs to it, too. It feels its impact inside me. It's moving outward. I feel it split me in two. It's almost out of my body, but then it's not, stopped by the arch at the base of my trunk. And then it starts rising again, back the way it came, all the way to the center of my chest. I breathe deeply. The air I inhale is breathed by the seed, too. 
and it takes flight. Next, it dives precipitously to the arch between my legs. This time, its impact is so great that its sweet point opens a new passage between my legs. Legs that stand upon earth, it seems the seed is saying, speaking to them through the passage that has just opened, be alert. My legs buckle, I squat, and at the center of that new passageway, the clitoris blossoms. The vivid pleasure of the apple breaking and opening my skin, raw flesh, sensitive, wise to the heart, intimate of blood, aware of earthly gravity, both rigid and soft. It contained both the world and the memory of the intense pleasure I felt when I bit into the fruit, as well as an awareness of myself and more, much more. I moved my hand to my clitoris. That first bite that crunched between my teeth and changed our lives has reserved for me, in that little black seed, the ultimate pleasure. 34, the clitoris. Clitoris, apple, fire, seed. The comparisons are limited, but here are three. One involves the apple. They say I gave the apple to Adam to taste it. If we take that as a given, as I'm doing, would know without a doubt that Adam felt something like what I did, although less intensely. His wasn't a lesser experience, but it was attenuated, reduced. His pleasure wasn't comparable to mine. The second involves fire, which the handsome angel held, making me long for it, and which I obtained, giving us day in the night, our anchor against the storms of nightly fear, our protection from the wild beasts, it would never have occurred to Adam to flirt with the angel or steal it. The third involves the seed. Aware of what the apple seed had given me, opening me up to the clitoris, I enjoyed touching myself. Adam awoke and realized there was something different about me. I was still touching my clitoris in ecstasy. Adam stirred the water in the luminous pond to get a better look at me. He regarded me coldly, scrutinizing me. Perhaps he was remembering the apple, but I'm certain that he wanted what I had. He didn't know how I had gotten it, so he made a simple attempt. He took my hand off my clitoris and put it between his legs, but there was nothing there. He didn't feel a thing. I took my hand back. And it wasn't just that night. I touched my clitoris constantly, the pleasure was always there, waiting for me. Adam wanted to imitate me, to have what I had. He had noticed that my hand wasn't the source of the sensation, so he tried with his own, and he kept on trying. Determined, he rubbed and rubbed and kept, it, kept on rubbing the space between his legs, even trying with other objects, but he couldn't obtain the delightful feeling I had been gifted by the seed of that delicious fruit made incarnate inside my body, manifesting outside it. Adam rubbed so much that he created a fold in the skin between his legs. This is our second course. Samantha, what's the book about? This is the Book of Eve. It's the female retelling of the story of Genesis in Eve's own words. Samantha has recently translated, as we already said. And how was that adventure of translating Eve's voice? It was quite unusual, unexpected, and a lot of fun because it's so different from the version that we all know from the Bible. Algo diferente, ya verán los que la lean, bastante distinta. She tells her own version, yes, and we do not imagine how she builds herself and how does she really become not only herself human, but founds humanity with the crafts, with the language, with food, obviously, uh, and then the not wonderfully uh, achieved in family relationships because we are going to see where's the seed of a pleasure but also the seed of violence violence against women and violence between males too Any Carmen comments? how did you have this idea 
the idea oh. for the novel? Where did it come from? I, I was interested on the character. It called my attention how come she's so bland in the version we have all known, how she has really no voice, how, how the only time she acts, she makes a mistake, uh, and how she's like a role model of women who happen to be made for, made of a piece of a man and made to attend and, and take care and give pleasure to others, so insignificant. And how come we have adopted her in our culture? And how were the former goddesses? And I then stumbled into Graves' book on Graves and Patai, extraordinary book on Jewish myths, and saw there had been former versions of uh, Eve. And I mainly nourished from the former versions and also from uh, what's happening in the world. In my youth, there were like two feminists on Mexico. And in my uh, uh, almost old age, because I'm 68, everybody is a feminist, male and females. And that is pretty extraordinary. So uh, I, it's not that I thought I'm going to write this book because this is happening, but that's how I read it now. One thing was to read Patai and try to understand why Eve was that way. And another thing is to write the novel. And the novel, as it happens with all novels of all authors, is the creation of all of us together. And unluckily, Samantha, I think we have to go to anything else you want to add? I want to ask you how you see this novel fitting into the larger body of work that you've written. But I don't know if we have time for you to answer such a big question. I don't think we have time, but I, I swear to the gods that I, to the ancient goddesses, the fierce ancient goddesses, that I'm going to answer it to you in other occasion. Muchas gracias, Samantha. Now we are going to go to our dessert. Sweet Eve, it's a video I made specially for you all today. Goodbye. Sam, thanks St. Jordi for receiving us. It was such a pleasure. El pilote dulce para la novela El libro de Eva de Carmen Bullosa. The following sweet, the sweet was cooked by me, the author of the book of Eve, to celebrate it's being published in English translation by Samantha Schnee at Develop. And I mean like a dessert, a sweet. That's what I mean. This was the recipe I used. First, I did not follow the steps of the novel, the steps of the eve of the novel. This is a totally different version. Two. For that same reason, I really just avoided to touch the points that appear in the book. But I did retell the story of Eve. Then, it is not written. I just tell the story and you will see the images that come attached to the narration. And then last and not least, uh, whoever appears here as Eve has the face of Tete, which happened to be my mother, Maria Esther Velázquez de la Fuente, who was born in Tabasco in 1932 and died in Mexico City in 69 of last century. And then I dedicate this version to my brothers, my male brothers, Pedro and Pablo Boullosa, and to a friend of mine, Lux Lucero Gonzalez. And here comes this sweet Eve. Once upon a time, the first woman on earth was erupted by a volcano, the Popocatépetl in Mexico City. And she came out with the smoke of the volcano and her name was, yes, Eve. She looked around and she thought the world was beautiful. The smoke pushed her out even more. She really 
wanted to continue watching and go further to see more of the beautiful earth. But alas, she immediately realized she only had a head, no feet, no body to walk around. So she immediately went down and found for her a torso. The smoke helped her push it out. More the torso, and then she pushed her own bounce to get her head out. And assembled herself. And there she was sitting on top of the volcano, full of the energy of it and the earth and the emotion of seeing what was around her, so electrified that even her hair turned green. And she started walking. She wanted to see it, wanted to see it all. And she walked and walked. Oh, alas, was she happy. She started running to see more. Her hair turned almost reddish of energy and, uh, and astonishment of what she was seeing. And she saw it was so big that she thought, how am I going to be able to transport myself to be able to observe what's around and look and visit and understand where am I? And she saw an eagle passing by, remembered that she had been told about angels when she lived in the, her head, lived in the volcano. I thought, well, what if I get myself some wings and like the eagle I just saw passing by, eh, also some claws might be useful. Yes, what if I turn into and she started flying, Eve started flying to be able to see more Earth, more of the beautiful planet we inhabit. And there, when she was traveling, she thought, well, what if I create a transportation that's even faster and so she did and zoom she was in a blink standing at the top of a green tree in a tropical forest and from there she started descending and she touched the earth oh that was beautiful the earth was so full of life and she felt it all and felt all herself restored and her body turned into a real body, the body of a woman. And alas, that felt good. She saw immediately the wider space, a wide space of the earth was water. She said, how am I going to move around in water? I want to feel the water on one side, but I want to move around and how am I going to do it without sinking? Mm, she still didn't know how to do a, a valse, a canoe, a boat, a galleon. So she thought, what if I use a tree? to float with, but mm, she saw trees didn't float. What if I turn it into a bowl, bowl where I can put myself inside? She was thinking of using a tree as a kind of cup, but that didn't work either. Okay, she said, her intuition helped her. I'm going to float. And she started floating first in a wide lake, in a wide, ocean in a wide river till she arrived to a manglar and there she felt so everything was so peaceful and it ran so silently that she fell asleep when she was asleep she started dreaming and the dreaming 
made her look at the world. The dream made her feel the earth differently. A place where maybe the trees had no leaves. Maybe there were dangers around. It was something she could not really understand, devoid of her body. Traveling her dreams, her dreams contained a bit of future. The future was joy, but was also pain. And she had a dream where some of her children had been born and were around her. She saw herself so fragile as if she was about to disappear and she was about to leave her children without her. And then she woke up. When she woke up after that deep sleeping, her knees were a little bit hurt. It was the sand. Well, they really hurt. So she brushed them around, raised her eyes and saw the sea from the beach looked so wonderful and that filled her of energy again and she started walking and walking leaving behind her the sea and walking and walking and she saw the rocks and she saw the bushes she found herself suddenly where there were no plants and that was reddish and also beautiful. There, suddenly, no water. She used her claws to move, but the earth was so dry, so painfully dry, that she couldn't really move. So she kind of started uh, trying different ways to continue visiting the earth till she decided to bounce and bouncing and bouncing. She found herself again in front of the sea. And there at last she again, her body returned again to her and she was so beautiful. Oh yes, so happy and so, so beautiful, she started looking around and ooh, ooh, she saw something that attracted her too much. A man. Oh, he also looked at her and they immediately fell in love and he himself got his own body and mainly they loved each other so much. Eve and her Adam, and they got married, and well, they were happy, and would have lived happily ever after if it wasn't because she found an apple, and it intrigued them both. They explored it explored what it contained, but alas, that is another story. Let's step outside of her apple or their apple and finish and wrap this sweet thanking my daughter Maria Aura for the sweet she brought before, the reading she gave us, and remembering her grandpa my mother's adorato. Goodbye.
Greetings, everybody, and uh, happy Dia de San Jordi. I'm Clyde Moneyhun. I translate uh, modern and contemporary Catalan poetry, mostly. And today I'm going to read to you from um, three poets that I think are amazing and extremely important. Um, the first one will be no surprise, uh, maybe the last one too. A la fira dels fols jo ja anaria, vindria, qui sap d'on, i ningú no sabria, els llavis suscats de molta vida, la genera cançons en cabal sense brida. That's a very famous poem from this very famous book, Bruix de Dol, Witch in Mourning, by the very famous Maria Merce Marsal. Marsal, I think, is clearly one of the most important 20th century Catalan poets, possibly, I think, one of the most important 20th century European poets. She's becoming um, uh, more and more widely known uh, outside of Catalonia. She's been translated into, at least in part, uh, into Spanish and Italian and French and uh, now uh, English. <laughs> uh, this book uh, is her second book. <clears throat> her first book, uh, Cau Lajunas, um, was uh, made a huge splash, won a national award. She was still in her mid twenties. This book came out a few more, a few uh, years after that, in 1979, and made an even bigger effect. And its importance, I think, has has just grown uh, since then. Um, as I was telling um, some students the other day, um, uh, graffiti from these these books, um, uh, from Marcel in general, is is ubiquitous all over. Catalonia. Um, there are streets named for her. There are schools named for her. There is, of course, the Institute, uh, Maria Merce Marsal, uh, dedicated to the study of her work. And uh, I've translated Witch in Mourning. The three books I'll read from today, by the way, are from Boodle Publishers uh, in London, and um, who um, are among uh, several publishers who have a very long and large and important list of um, Catalan literature in English translation. The book, uh, the poem uh, that I was just um, uh, reciting in Catalan is called Bridal in English. To the feast of fools I would go from who knows where and no one would know with lips much scarred from so much life, a peddler of songs on a horse with no bridle. What bait lures me back to the hook? Love, bitter star drifting beckons I cross the stream to the other side. A peddler of songs on a horse with no bridle. Chains are prisons, and I ran away through the thieves' quarter at the break of day. To the feast of fools I would ride, a peddler of songs on a horse with no bridle. <clears throat> that poem, I think, it draws on uh, imagery from medieval uh, poetry, and Catalan, of course, traces its roots to um, uh, medieval uh, uh, literature to troubadour songs, which I think that is sort of an echo of, to the um, the vast work of Ramon Yu. Um, and so we're not surprised when we see those that kind of uh, imagery. This book is also full of sonnets. I think there are about two dozen or more sonnets. And so I'd like to read you <clears throat> one of those. Your lips, a piece of fruit, pomegranate, Rebellious angel, smelling all of ginger, capture me in the folds of this fever. Come to me with the greenness of rain. A lizard, you flee into my hair unrestrained. In open sun, wings of a nocturnal bird. You use for a heart the moon, or even Saturn, and in your eyes, a taste of morning fog. Your mineral body, salt wine, strawberry, like a serpent, coil yourself upon my stomach and find my very core with the venom, with the venom of your love. You will be a black cat and I a witch. Wandering, we will fix upon each other and in its delirium, the moon blind will set the stage afire. There is a section in the book. This book uh, uses many uh, poetic forms. There's free verse. Um, there's rhymed verse here and there. Not much of it. There, there are these sonnets. They're basically songs 
uh, also here and there. And in fact, many of these poems, many of Marcel's poems uh, from, from all of her books have been set to music uh, many more than once. There's a section in this book of basically nursery rhymes. Uh, they sound like children's poems. They're not children's poems. Um, uh, um, Marcel famously said that, um, um, like all poets in Spain, uh, in any language, um, she um, uh, owes a debt to Garcia Lorca. And I think as Garcia Lorca used um, uh, Andalusian folk songs from the south of Spain, um, rewrote them, recreated them, um, she uh, said that, the, um, that nursery rhymes were the folk music of women and children. And I think that's where this section came from. All these poems, this book, um, across the book from beginning to end is, reflects a kind of awakening in her, um, of um, her um, love for women and the need to create and nurture uh, a society of women, a community of women. And um, so in this section of um, nursery rhymes, each poem is dedicated to a specific woman uh, in her life at the time. This one is dedicated to Cinta Portillo. If you were Cinta, a little honey bunny, no greyhound or hunting dog would catch you, nor would the wind hunt you with its tight snare. If I were a hunter, I'd be out of luck. While your eyes blinded me with their light, you would stuff great bunches of fennel down the barrel of my gun and into my cartridge belt. And you would adorn the valleys and clouds with fragrant grains to complete the decorations. Now and then you would press your ear against the earth to hear the sound of the growing grass, my little honey bunny, and I would envy the planet. You would roam with courage and resolve the width and breadth of Baixebra and Ribera, Terralta, Moncia, to the very gates of Morelia. But if you went any farther, the longing would be enough to shatter me if you were Sinta, a little honey bunny. And um, I'll stop with uh, Marcel with an extraordinarily famous poem again. Uh, one of those ones that's been set to music um, more than once. <clears throat> it's called Canso de Fercami, and it's dedicated to Marina. And in, in Catalan, it begins, Vos finia la meva barca, y a violetas, a desdín, anirem lluny sense recanse, d'allò que haurem deixat aquí. Do you want to come aboard my boat? There are violets in profusion. We'll travel far without regretting whatever we leave behind. We'll go far without regretting. And we will be two. We will be three. Come, come aboard the boat. The sails are raised. The sky is open. There will be oars for every arm. And we will be four. We will be five. And our eyes, nomadic stars, will forget all borders. We set sail with the March winds and clouds of restless spirit. Yes, we will be 20, we will be 40, flying the moon for our flag. Witches of yesterday, witches of today, we will find ourselves in the open sea. We will spread life everywhere like a flowering dance. In the skin of the salted wave, we will be 500, we will be a thousand. We will lose ourselves in wandering together will make the night our own. Poet that uh, Marcel greatly admired is Ana Dodas, Ana Dodas Inoge. Um, Dodas um, published a book in her early 20s, uh, a short book of poetry uh, called um, Livian um, Paisacha, um, uh, Winter uh, landscape with winter, and uh, it won a national award, uh, drew a lot of attention. She had another book almost completely done, 98, 99% finished uh, in manuscript form, ready to go to the publisher, uh, when at the age of 23, um, she um, was uh, killed, she was murdered. 
and the crime has never been solved. She was um, in southern France with a friend having a vacation um, and um, disappeared and the bodies were found. Um, a few years later, uh, her friends and family put together this book, Avoca, The Volcano. It is a combination of the first book she published, the second book she had ready to go, and uh, a, a large selection of uh, unpublished uh, and uncollected poems. I'd like to, I think this poet is extremely important. And um, I'd like to read um, a few poems from, from um, each uh, section, one poem from each section. This one is characteristic of the first book. A brilliant meteor frees itself and lights the frozen crust of the earth. Pulsating sparks, faint stars in the darkness, like a chickpea, a ruby, it tumbles over and over, now black, now white. They must be very cold, much, much colder, to dissolve the mineral hardness of fossilized blood. And um, here's a series of one, two, three, three uh, short poems. Um, from the um, second book, Avuka. <clears throat> this is the still hour of birds, the hour of trees, and these the plains, sleeping landscapes of the star wandering and solitary. The aqueducts are still, and still are the waters, these pools, and nobody to bathe in them. A restless clarinet trills, immersed in the black abyss of birds and the hour. Behind the mountains, crouching, await the nights, ready to leap over summits, to pour themselves, spill into the valley until they lick the feet of the house. Already heard the shuddering rumble, the rocks rolling in the quarries, ferocious, the night launches its revenge. This is the night when moons gyrate and terrifying bloodsuckers show themselves, gaping mouths with no lips. This is the night of rivers bleeding, of long shadows, of extinguished fires, the night of coal, the mirrors without reflections. One night alone, thick, it slowly decomposes. And uh, the section of um, uncollected poems, unpublished poems is, I think, just, there are wonderful, wonderful poems in here. And uh, it was um, an emotional experience to, um, to translate them and get to the end of them, knowing that this was the end of the poetry um, that we are going to have from Anna Dodas. Um, and here's one of my favorite ones. We were silver one day or one night. Yes, a night of metals that polished the surface of everything, the motionless bodies, the silvered cold, the silence glittering and sharp as a sword, a silver-plated bath under the numb skin, metallic, all metallic, like everything was mineral, this moon of brass, these copper mountains, the frozen glitter of the night, all the straight limbs of silver, eyes of silver, skin of silver, silver, all the painful breaths and feelings and the grieving, glowing shadows and the strangled voice of a throat become silver, so quiet, listening to the fossil silence of this mortal night. Remember the night of mirrors, this metallic night. This um, edition, by the way, has a, uh, a very good introduction by uh, Esther Poe, and it has uh, an afterword written by uh, Maria Merce Marsal. And the last book I'll publish 
that I published, the last book I'll uh, uh, read from, uh, is by Dolores Mikkel. Uh, I read an article just a few days ago um, uh, that was of the opinion that Dolores Mikkel is um, the heir apparent to Marsal, uh, clearly one of the most important poets working in um, Catalan today. Uh, she has been in her life prolific um, uh, with, um, gosh, eight, nine, ten books of poetry, um, uh, a television play, a one-woman show. Um, um, she publishes journalism, criticism, uh, and more. And uh, I've published uh, one, of the, one of the earlier books uh, from the 90s called uh, Haikus del Camione, Truck Driver Haikus. And it is, uh, as the title implies, 196 haikus in Catalan, every one of them, yes, 575. And so I felt obligated uh, to do my very, very best to uh, use the same uh, pattern. Um, Dolores was asked, uh, why haikus? And her answer was just basically, I like them. <laughs> I read them. I was intrigued by them. I wrote a few. And then um, it, it, it occurred to me that I needed to write more. Uh, why truck drivers? Um, she was doing a lot of driving, she said, and I uh, wrote about truck drivers. Who's the truck driver? Is it you? And she said, uh, sometimes. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, the um, each one of the haikus can stand alone, like any good haiku. Uh, however, there it's clear that uh, in the book you can see some sequences. Uh, some some of them belong next to each other. So I'm just going to read a few pages. <clears throat> uh, of the book in sequence. And this first one happens to be the very first one. I found it on the internet long, long ago. The first one that I ever read uh, and published. And this was the one that convinced me I needed to find this book. <laughs> you see the window where that sparrow is sleeping? The pain is bleeding. Virgins and angels, landlords of homes with no keys. The rats are singing. Suburbs and ghettos illuminate the lanterns for the lizard. Living empty lots, you carry light in your hand to the brandy glass. Little boys and girls chasing after nests and plots. Land of the pear trees, naked newborn babes suckling grass on the margins with their muddy lips. Underneath the bridge, an old woman is resting in motionless sleep. Underneath the wind, an old woman is scaring the sun coming up. In the undergrowth, the cat and the man wrestle and God referees. So God blows a stack and then whips out a cigar. Bored, he lights it up. The man tells the cat, that sardine is mine, all mine. And the virgin, God so that you can feed your children, your wife, your fear, give your soul to me. Give me a dry crust of bread with a nice herring on an antique plate. Give me any old scrap of happiness hanging from a high skylight. Now give me your breast. Take from me this thirst of thirsts that never leaves me. Steal my sex from me. Chop it into pieces. Sew it on the esplanade. Replace my eyes with white mother of pearl buttons made of jet black fangs. Kids of my kids, kids, kids sitting, kids of other kids, and what of the gorse? Poverty spinach, born alive in my garden and killing itself. To a certain death, the black wing that crosses the busy highway. Hey, you, truck driver. Would you rather be flying a plane full of rocks? <laughs> Truck driver haikus. Uh, the last few things I'll, um, I'll read two more poems from uh, Dolores Mikkel. She and I uh, have been working on, um, uh, actually, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll do three. Uh, we've been working on uh, her book from 2015 called Misa Pajessa, Peasant Mass. Um, uh, Dolores's themes uh, are, uh, I think she's witty. I think she's very funny. I think she's very beautiful in this poetry. Um, her themes across her books are the most serious themes there are, especially for a poet uh, in Catalonia, in Spain. Uh, she is a critic, 
of organized religion, particularly Catholicism, particularly Spanish Catholicism. She has a lot to say about it. And this book, funnily enough, uh, Peasant Mass, um, uses the forms and um, discursive uh, habits of um, religious language, uh, Catholic language, um, songs, canticles, bits and pieces of the mass, homilies, litanies, and so on. Even a little chunk, I think, of the Old Testament, as I'll show you in just a minute. Um, her books also are about uh, the emptiness of life here in late stage capitalism, um, the, uh, the uh, death, or if not death, at least the act of uh, uh, killing of the soul uh, in modern life. Here's a poem. Uh, uh, anybody who's Catholic out there knows that there are three readings in every mass, and one of them is from the Old Testament. And Catholics are therefore familiar with their bits and pieces of the Old Testament. This poem is called On the Kisses of God. <clears throat> Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. I want to gorge myself on the fruits of your mouth. I want to cool myself with the breath of your mouth. Wrap my skin in the warmth of your skin. Breathe the breath of your eternal silence. Receive the communion of your moist tongue. Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. From the cold, bring me the sacred ice, the polar kiss, the burning ice of your mystic tongue. Be present within your words, wheat within the bread, be the yeast in the wheat of the bread of your words. Your saliva would lead me to the towers of the universe where the swallow steals the eyes of light. Kiss me with the kisses of your soul, become saliva, become taste buds, become nerve cells, become mine. Declare me your kisses, harlot. Declare me the air of your higher carnality. Kiss me with the naked kisses of I and thou, with kisses of laughter, with kisses of tears. May both peace and war rest in me in equanimity. Kiss me with your eternal death, with the blossom of your death. In spring, I would strip your lips bare of all their flowers. Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. A very serious poem. Here's a here's a very serious poem in a, <clears throat> a slightly less serious tone of voice, maybe. <clears throat> it's called Mammals with Fleas. I, God, mammal, entranced, observe the universe and all things invisible, and take note of the flea that lives on the belly of my dog. Will the flea also in her turn take note of me with the same divine complacency? Will she risk the hypothesis of hermetic universes? Will she suddenly feel an infinite desire for love and call it God, 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 find God in a canticle emanating from the microbes that rest motionless on the belly of the flea, and all the way up and down and right into my hand or even further? Will the flea feel infinitely omnipotent on the belly of my dog? Will she decide to destroy the forest of long, soft fur that autumn uproots and that fills my apartment like corn straw? Will the flea consider nuclear war? Will she perceive the westernness of the empty centuries Will the flea go into therapy or psychiatric care if she intuits that she is someone that she is seen by someone whom she also sees? Will she blame her father and her mother, the flea, for this neurosis? Will she call me goddess or something much worse? Will she talk, call my dog goddess? Will she imagine she's the daughter of my dog? Will she also ask questions as stupid as mine? Will she crucify other fleas? And the last poem from this book, Meets the Pajessa, by Dolores Mikel, uh, a book we're hoping to publish uh, very soon. <clears throat> this is from the part of the math, uh, the mass. 
uh, the transubstantiation of, of the host. And it is called uh, the transubstantiation of the rabbit, which is the stand in for the host and the happiness of the old woman. The bits of bone, the shreds of meat, the eyes out of their orbits, the dismemberment, the dissection of the one was incomplete. The old woman collected the leftovers in a bucket, went to a nearby field and scattered them as if they were seeds. She scattered also the bones of some olives and cadavers of olive oil. And then it was a great miracle. It arose like an angel. It was white, immaculate, weightless, ethereal. It passed through the atmosphere. It entered the rings of Saturn. It passed through the beatific dreams of men. It appeared in the silence of the oniric waves. It covered with kisses an asteroid that had lost its orbit. It traveled to a globular cluster, created a supernova, and came to rest in a black hole. The event was celebrated by a meteor storm. The old woman was happy, fulfilled. She lowered her gaze from the universe. She regarded the sun field. It was full of olive trees. It had always been full of olive trees, but now it was considered a miracle. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Buy books. More importantly, give books and red roses. And I will see you again, I hope, next year.
I am Anton Her, and I am the translator for Kyungsuk Shin's I Went to See My Father, which is published by Astro House in New York, and uh, Wine and Filda Nicholson in London. And uh, just to tell you a bit about this book. So I have translated Kyungsuk Shin uh, twice before, uh, The Court Dancer in 2018, and Violets in, uh, I believe it was 2021. No, it was uh, April 2022. And um, Kyung-suk Shin has uh, quite the range as a writer. Uh, she is known for writing historical novels. She's known for writing um, auto fiction and uh, essays and practically anything that you can think of. But I think she's mostly known for uh, her great uh books that uh, her novels that kind of discuss memory the relationship between memory fiction and um, dramatization so the way that she writes you kind of don't know where her memory starts and where fiction begins um, where something is something that is remembered uh, that happened actually happened and uh, what's you know what's made up from her imagination and what part is the narrator's imagination and um, I think this is a very, 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 so she's a very experimental, um, very quite edgy and progressive writer, I feel. Even though um, at first glance, she writes about, you know, mother-daughter relationships or, you know, Korean, the Korean War. And people think that, oh, these are very old topics that people have, that other writers have done over and over again. But really, it's the way that Kyung Sik Shin writes that I feel uh, makes her different from most Korean writers and actually makes her extremely cosmopolitan and uh, just the way that she writes is very similar to, for example, South American writers who um, deal with magic realism, who also interrogate the boundary between what is real and what is uh, fantastical. And so, without further ado, I would like to read from you in an excerpt from I Went to See My Father. Uh, translated by yours truly. So the story of this book is that her father, um, the narrator's father, begins to suffer from uh, d dementia and other um, health ailments. And uh, she hears that he, <coughs> excuse me, he starts crying uh, when uh, uh, his wife or the narrator's mother is taken to Seoul for treatment. And so this breaks her heart, and so she decides to go down to where her father is living and um, to just take care of him for a while until her mother gets better and comes back home. And so, hence the title, I went to see my father. And so this is a father-daughter narrative, <coughs> excuse me, which is, I don't have COVID, I have acid reflux. Um, the, so it's uh, like father-daughter uh, father narratives are a, bit, are a bit rarer in literature. And um, I'm kind of hard pressed to think of a contemporary that exists in Korea that talks about father-daughter narratives. So uh, I think it's a very, very, very special book um, for those of you who are fathers of daughters or for those of you who are daughters and love their fathers. All right, here we go. <clears throat> I get out of my taxi and drag my luggage to the house. No matter which gate you enter, there's nowhere to go once you're in the house. It's the true center of the village. The two gates are always open. Neighbors who live near the road and want to go to the ditch come through the main gate, cross the courtyard, and go out the small gate. And those who live on the other side and are in a hurry to get to the road come through the small gate, cross the courtyard, and go out the main gate. Father was lost in thought, standing in the courtyard as I entered through the small gate. I let go of my luggage so the noise didn't disturb him. Once the wheels were stilled, silence descended around us. Father wasn't lost in thought, but he was concentrating on something in front of him. What was he looking at? I left my bag behind and approached him. In the middle of the courtyard was a little garden surrounded by stones, with a hydrangea in full bloom that a butterfly was fussing over. Father was watching the butterfly's movements in total stillness. Father? Only then did he take his eyes off the butterfly and look at me. His face was so gaunt, his cheeks sunken, and it looked like he was blinking at the sunlight. Father was crying. 
tears fell on his dried cheeks. The sight of his tears felt like someone had hit me on the back of the head, a ringing shock like my head had split open. Father, beside himself, wiped his face with the back of his hand like a little boy. His wet eyes were not focused on me, but they were searching for something. Pretending not to have noticed his tears, I spoke in a bright voice. What were you looking at just now? I hugged his waist. Is it you, Han? You've come home. Despite standing right in front of him, Father looked at me like I was a specter. What on earth were you looking at so closely? A butterfly. That butterfly? I looked again at where Father had been staring. A white butterfly flew up the camellia's tree and sat on it. Perhaps it was only a camellia tree, by name though, because it hadn't bloomed all winter. But it was well underway now, its buds a deep, deep red in the sun. There was already a pile of fallen blossoms on the ground. Underneath that butterfly... Father tried to say something but didn't finish his sentence. What's underneath that butterfly? When he pointed down, the butterfly fluttered from the camellia to a pile of stones by the hydrangeas. A cairn? There were no other piles of stone except that one, stacked with care. Why on earth are you crying because of a butterfly, I wanted to ask, but I suppressed the question and said instead, Why is there a pile of stones here? I buried him here. Chammy is buried here. Chammy. Someone in my family had told me that Chammy had died. I guess that was his resting place. I stared down at the cairn and the butterfly that had landed on it. Father must have stacked the cairn to mark where he'd buried Chami. The butterfly sitting on the memorial was flapping its delicate wings. When my daughter was still with us, I had had a habit of taking things that had become burdensome down by train or car to my parents' house to lay down at their feet. Here you go. This is your home now. And with that, I would return to the city alone. Two cats, two puppies, and a parrot. Father made a space in the tool shed for the cats, putting down mats and fashioning a little house for them. My goal was for the cats to move in with my parents, but I failed at that. My father was country folk through and through. If you let the cats live in the house, others will mock us, he had said. Hence the woven straw mats on the floor of the shed for the cats to stretch out on and scratch. The cats liked climbing, so he put up ladders and tied bits of rope here and there. But the cats didn't stay put in the tool shed, despite my father's wishes. They slipped out and walked about on the courtyard walls or the roof. They napped in the fields or climbed the persimmon tree. It was impossible to tell who owned them, as they would freely go in and out of everybody's homes. I urged father to feed them cat food instead of rice or banchan side dishes that people ate, but he replied, What? Are they cows? Why do they need a separate feed? Nevertheless, he served them dry cat food in their bowls at night time, along with some fresh water. Saying he had bought cow feed before but not cat feed, he would zip downtown on his motorcycle to get more of it when he ran out. Mother, fascinated by this new habit, would poke her head out and half-teasingly say, Going out to give the kitties food? Mother said the only reason he did anything was because I was the one who asked him to. Think about it, she once said, if I suggested it myself. Cats? What cats? That's what he would have said. Your father, he does everything you tell him, right? When mother needed to nag father about something, she would call me up in Seoul. Tell your father to drink less. Tell him the roads are dangerous so he should give up his motorbike. Tell him to stop going out to the music hall downtown for a while. Under orders from mother, I called him to tell him. Blah, blah, blah. I would go on as instructed, and father would listlessly say, Oh, really? Okay, I will. Father and the cats got along relatively well. The cats wandered around freely, and when they were hungry they came to the tool shed and ate their cat food, and at night they slept in their houses. Still, seeing them go half feral since leaving the city and settling in the country, I couldn't quite decide if I'd done the right thing or not. Some years later, the cats disappeared completely. The dogs did not do well in this house, either. When I brought them here, I had thought they would at least be able to run around to their heart's content. But the fact that the dogs were off their leashes scared the people who cut through our courtyard to go to, to the irrigation ditch or the big road. I'd wanted the cats to live in the house and not the tool shed, and the dogs to live off their leashes, but I only learned later on that this was much more difficult to do in the country. When I left the cats or dogs at my parents' place, I would call my father every morning for a month or two, checking to see whether the cats used their litter boxes or whether the dogs' leashes were too short. 
father would say. The cats are clever. They cover up their business with sand. I think we need to name one of the dogs. What about Maru? Father always answered each and every one of my questions. A few months would go by, and my thoughts would stop drifting to dogs and cats I'd left behind in the country. I didn't call father as often after that. The parrot father had buried in the garden was one I had gotten from the market. Saying I had got it probably isn't correct. The parrot followed me. The Tongin market is half an hour from my house in Seoul by car, and there happens to be a shop where I occasionally buy fresh fish. The reason I drive all the way to that shop is because they have herring and flatfish and freshwater fish, the likes of which are not sold at my local supermarket. And not only is everything fresh, the owner is very generous and often throws in a fistful of sea squirts for free. One day, I went with my daughter to buy some sole, and a display of mugwort happened to catch my eye, so I bought a bundle and slipped it into my shopping tote. I was about to move on when I saw a parrot walking around the market. A parrot? In pictures or books, parrots are normally yellow or green or white, but this one was dark and gray, even its face. I thought it must have an owner somewhere, but it seemed to be alone. A parrot? How odd. I walked on towards the fishmonger's shop, and the parrot hopped along after me, like a puppy. It maintained its distance, though, so I assumed it would eventually tire of this game. My daughter exclaimed, Mommy, the parrot is following us. She loved it. At the fishmonger's place, we bought a nice big sole and a codfish, and the parrot came right up to my feet. It followed us even as we were leaving the market. Go! I was so annoyed that I shouted, Go! Go away! As if I were scolding a person. The parrot stared at me like it had something to say, but it didn't go anywhere. Even when we had reached our car that was parked in the alley behind Tongin Market, it followed us. The parrot keeps following us, my daughter said between laughs. I walked right back to the store where I had bought the mugwort, the place I had first seen the parrot. What am I going to do with this parrot? It keeps following me. The old lady who had sold me the mugwort tisk tisked. The parrot had apparently been wandering around the market for four days. It couldn't have escaped on its own, said the lady, so the owner must have abandoned it. The old lady looked up at me and said, I suppose you're the owner now. She told me that it did follow people around the market from time to time, but if any of them approached, the parrot would bite and turn aggressive. It seemed calm and friendly towards us. But why? I stared at the gray parrot. I had to go home. I couldn't keep carrying the soul and codfish while being followed around by a parrot bodyguard. I tried shaking it off my tail trail when it seemed momentarily distracted, but when I turned around, it would be there again. The parrot is mommy's copycat, my daughter said as she caught up with us. I tried running away all the way to the electricity pole at the end of the market without looking back at all, but it still followed me. Go away! But even shouting at it felt pointless. My daughter and I ducked into the butcher shop or pretended to buy mallow in a vegetable store. We'd sneak out the other entrance, but it was all for naught. How strange it was to be a target of a parrot. It all felt rather pathetic, and when I opened the car door for my daughter, the parrot hopped into the car before she could get in. This parrot was chummy. It's strange. Not a single sick thing about him when I woke up. But when I woke up, he was dead. He ate well the night before. Father got along well with the gray parrot. He was the one who named it chummy. From saying the parrot, meaning that parrot sure can talk well. Obviously, it could only learn whatever words father taught it. What was this about it talking well? Uh, but I didn't voice my thoughts and went along with calling it chummy. You miss him. We were friends. Father's voice sounded so empty. When I had first brought Chami to father, he had laughed about the fact that I was offloading a bird this time. But it's not an ordinary bird, father. If it's not ordinary, then what is it? It speaks. It speaks. I'm telling you, teach it. It can learn to say things you want it to say instead of you. Father, who had been so against bringing dogs or cats inside the house, for some reason hung Chami's cage indoors. No one in the village had ever kept a car parrot, and while everyone had seen magpies or sparrows or woodpeckers or ducks or boobles or broad-billed rollers, no one had ever seen a parrot before, he must have thought. And he considered himself less likely to be mocked if he kept the parrot out of sight. Father cared a lot about and was gen greatly influenced by what people said. When father, hears someone, when father hears something and says, people are saying, this means that people are saying what people are saying is wrong and that he doesn't believe in them. And so... 
I left the gray parrot uh, behind and again began to call him every morning. Over the phone, I could actually hear him teaching the parrot how to speak. By the time it could call Father Appa, Dad, the parrot refused to spend a moment away from Father's side. Appa? When I first heard the parrot say that, I scoffed. How dare this parrot use this informal term of endearment I myself never got to use with Father. Appa, indeed. Father got rid of the cage and set up a peg for the parrot to sit on, but it preferred to perch on Father's shoulder. Sitting there, the not insignificantly sized bird would say, Hello, and welcome to anyone who visited. Father ended up having to take the parrot to his weekly physical therapy sessions. One morning, when I called Father, the parrot shouted in a cheerful old man's voice, Long time no see! I almost fell off my chair. Why is it saying that? At my question, Father burst out laughing. The sound of his laughter was unexpectedly clear and pure. Well, as long as it makes Father laugh, that's that. As if determined to never lose anyone ever again, the parrot that had traveled from Tongin Market to the city of Jay stuck right by Father at all times. When Father lay on his back in bed, he sat on his stomach, and when he lay on his stomach, he sat on his back. When Father got up and had to, ha and had to hammer a nail or something, it would slide down his arm like it was a playground ride and sit on the back of his hand. And whenever I happened to call, it wouldn't forget to shout in its cheerful old man's voice, Long time no see! Father still looked deflated, so I put my arm through his and changed the subject. Did you just come back from somewhere? Not listening to me, he said, Yes, come inside, and led the way to the steps leading up to the front door of the house. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, I'm Danielle Parati. I'm Maria Borio. And we're here at Pod 39 in New York City uh, in March of 2023. We've been doing some readings as part of Maria's US tour for her book, Transparencies. Um, and we'd like to read you some poems. So Maria is going to start with a poem called Isola, which is um, um, inspired by a neighborhood in Milan. Isola. Nella notte, il vetro dei grattacieli di Isola sembra una faglia sull'orizzonte, il semicerchio della struttura che dice il potere di rendere solida l'acqua e liquefarsi al momento che hai finito di circoscrivere. Qui le ore per buio distinguono il silenzio netto, il rullio dei treni, le gocce nell'aria, le fibre, ma l'alba ci ha fermato in un suono contorto. Le curve del tempo vuoto, la fuga nel sottopassaggio, l'elettricità aperta tra gli ascensori e il cibo decongelato, gli artefici di questa pulizia di vetro o una prova molto umana per fermare un azzurro fragilissimo. Seduti al limite della fontana, ecco il sorpasso. Il freddo incorruttibile del buio si restringe e una folla normale scala i tratti del volto. Al bar mi dici che è metafora del mondo oggi, trattenendo il cibo nella bocca, il grande vetro di questi edifici e il cibo profondo negli organi. Meccanica e carne invisibili lavorano e la loro imperfezione avvolge al puro e all'impuro entrando, uscendo dal grande vetro, come l'arte afona e oscura di Duchamp taglia a sezione. Nel caso premi la mano, può frangersi o resistere come l'etere resiste, e lì coscienti o da noi separati, puro e impuro, il grande schermo di isola o un continente. Isola at night, Isola's high rise glass seems a fault on the horizon, a half circle of building that commands the power to make water solid and liquefy at the moment you're done circumscribing. Here, the hours distinguish by dark, the tidy silence, the rumble of trains, drops in the air, fibers, but the dawn halts us in contorted sound. The curves of empty time, the tunnel escape, elevators, defrosted food, and open charge between them. The architects of this glass neatness or a human attempt to still the fragilest blue. Seated on the fountain's edge, here's the takeover. Incorruptible, the cold of dark shrinks back and the usual crowd scales the face's lines. 
At the cafe, you tell me it's a metaphor for our world, hoarding food in its mouth, the huge glass of these buildings, and the food organ deep. Machine and flesh toil, invisible, and their imperfection wraps pure and impure, entering, exiting from the huge glass that's cut into sections like a mute, obscure Duchamp. If you squeeze your hand, it could break or resist as the ether resists, and there, self-conscious or self-removed, pure and impure, Isola's vast screen or a continent. So Maria, Isola is actually one of my very favorite poems in uh, your book. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what inspired the poem. Uh, uh, Isola is a neighborhood in Milan, and it's one of the most uh, uh, European spot in Italy. Uh, all the architecture is made of glass, and this idea of glass and reflections and see-through uh, glasses, but also see-through see um, screens and water is one of the um, main uh, uh, topics of the book. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of ideal place. Uh, for the book. I think one of the things I loved about this poem as I started translating it is how commanding the opening is. Like it really puts you in a setting um, that's very concrete and that very quickly establishes sort of the world, not just of the poem, but of this book, right? Because you're at the center of all of this glass. There's water, there's glass, there's power, there's electricity in this poem. And then there's things like fountains also, which to me strike me as very sort of traditional Italian imagery, right? So for me, this poem um, really captures the kind of mix of old and new and the tensions between them and the questions that you're asking mm -hmm. um, in a lot of your, your poems. The poem I'm going to read uh, is Prospettiva, Perspective. Um, um, it's about a um, travel, a travel with um, a bullet train in Italy from Milan to Florence. Um, Daniele is going to read the translation. Prospettiva. La linea dell'orizzonte sembrava il confine del mondo fermato tra il tuo polo e il mare. Il mare si curva perché la terra è un globo. Le mani sospese tra naso e orizzonte danno pugni, spingono contro l'orizzonte immagini di incoerenza. Adesso, in un viaggio di due ore, tagli a metà il paese, passando a fil di lama la nebbia del nord e l'azzurro al centro, quattrocentesco, l'affresco di Piero della Francesca, che vorrei trasparente, sopra al mondo la sua prospettiva. Ma oggi, nel vulcano, sgranate le persone rincorrono un punto di fuga interiore, dalla cornea alla pupilla, e le scie rosse, sottili, schizzano elettriche. Ma un bisogno di verità deve pur correre come la lama aguzza del treno ci toglie soli da noi stessi, io, noi, e mentre corre ti vedo in una casa vuota, ancora con i pugni paralleli spingendo immagini che fanno sciami di insetti e polveri. Dietro il vetro della finestra, l'alba ha tagliato il cortile. Le ombre dei vestiti asciutti corrono sui muri. I confini, invecchiando, invertono la prospettiva l'uno nell'altro, come i poli antipoli e uniti del pianeta strappano l'orizzonte l'uno all'altro. Nel vetro tagliente dell'alba, la lama del treno è una prospettiva aerea. Esseri fragili hanno occhi che si toccano. Perspective. The horizon line seemed the edge of the world, fixed between your axis and the sea. Earth is a globe, so the sea curves, hover hovering between your nose and the horizon, your hands punch, thrust incoherent pictures against it. Now you cut the country in half in a two-hour trip, riding a blade from northern fog to the blue at its 15th century center the Piero della Francesca fresco, I want transparent, that perspective over the world. But today at the volcano, grainy faces chase an interior point of vanishing. From cornea to pupil, their fine red wakes splash electric. Yet even the need for truth must race the train's pointed blade that pulls us from ourselves. I, we, 
and as it races, I see you in an empty house, still with your fists parallel, you thrust pictures, make insect swarms and dust. Behind the window pane, dawn cuts the courtyard, the shadows of dried clothes run the walls, aging borders trade one perspective for another, like pole and anti-pole united wrench planet from horizon. In the sharp pain of dawn, the train's blade is an aerial view. Fragile beings have eyes that touch. So another thing I really loved about translating uh, these poems, Maria, is that um, as someone with uh, Italian heritage and who's spent time in Italy, this, this, your work really gave me a sense of Italian culture that I hadn't seen before. It was a perspective on Italian culture and Italian life that I hadn't seen before. And so I learned a lot from it. Um, and when we read this poem together um, at the Italian Cultural Institute, we mentioned that it's a very Italian poem. And so I wanted to know what you what you meant by that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very Italian poem because it is um, settled, really settled, <laughs> settled uh, in Italy. It's a travel from Milan to Florence and it's, it describes the way you see the colors of the landscape changing because in uh, Pianura Padana you have this uh, pale bluish atmosphere uh, while um, as you cross the Appennino the color of the sky becomes the, what I call the real uh, Italian blue sky uh, that is the same blue that you can see in paintings such as Piero della Francesca mm -hmm. frescoes of Giotto's fresco so it's that kind of blue that is really Italian. You can see, mm -hmm. in my opinion, only there. But the poem contains also an image, imaginary, that goes beyond the um, the Italian borders, mm -hmm. and that is, um, in a way, I could say that it is um, open to a um, Western perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's the Italian heritage in a. Um, more beyond global. Global. beyond global. global, more global, more global. It's the kind of world Italian literature, I would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is the, the 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 idea that I had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and again, you have these very sort of um, industrial contemporary images. I mean, the train, obviously, the Frecciarossa, which is this very very high speed train mm -hmm. in Italy, um, that in and of itself has this evocative name right the the, the red arrow red right? arrow yeah. um and so yeah. that is central to this poem as well one of the things that maria and i have talked about a lot is the title of this collection because um maria's title of her collection in italy is trasparenza which means literally transparency um singular mm -hmm. and um Obviously, transparency is one of the major themes of the book. The book draws attention to the various transparent or supposedly transparent services through which we try to know each other. Glass, screens, even water, which can be, um, which can distort images um, and um, misrepresent images. So it's drawing attention to the things that we think are transparent, the media that we think are transparent, but that actually aren't. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed uh, in, in translating Italian poetry is that it's much more open to abstraction than I think English language poetry often is. So when I, when I translated the title, I translated it to transparencies in the plural to give it a little bit of a more material or concrete quality. Uh, for me, it evokes those transparencies from school that they used to use to um, to project images on the on the board. Um, and you were okay with that with that change, Maria. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, of course. And also because I thought that transparency is sounds better in English. Well, it's interesting. I yes. thought of this last night that yeah. trasparenza has yeah. four syllables and transparencies also four, has yeah. four. And so I think that might mm -hmm. be partly why I was mm -hmm. also inspired to change it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that, well, in Italian, if you say trasparenza, then yeah, it has an abstract meaning, but it can also work quite well um, if it's referred to um, concrete things okay. so it has a double a double meaning it could have a, a double meaning well transparency in english it's not like that 
-hmm. it's really trans transcendent in a way a bit more a bit, a bit more, more abstract yeah. a bit say. more abstract so transparencies um, really gives the idea of what I meant while trasparenze the Italian mm -hmm. plural doesn't work at all mm -hmm. doesn't work in Italian and um, yeah um, well, for, from my perspective mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that um, this plural meaning that the title conveys it could be also referred to what translation mm -hmm. is because transparent translation trans um, everything else mm -hmm. so this idea of going through or <clears throat> being through something mm -hmm. like the poetic uh, poetic word should be poetic word is always uh, a translation. Mm -hmm. it's always a translation in a way it's always um, going through something it's going deeper and deeper what we leave so and also to, to, to catch the core of the the human even if everything around seems not so human. So to be trans, transparent, transpa, translators, trans, transcendent. transcendent in a way, but transcendent doesn't mean that you are up above, that mm -hmm. you are on the clouds. Mm -hmm. It means that you are asking things and asking reality what you are, why you are there, why we are there, uh, what is the time, what is the meaning of the time in which we live so it gives a lot i think also to the value of poetry I'm sending you my warmest greetings uh, from Williamstown, uh, Massachusetts. My name is Brahim Al Gabli, and I'm an assistant professor of Arabic studies and comparative literature at Williams College. And my intervention today will focus on the development of Amazigh literature and its importance. Uh, in the construction of Amazigh identity, particularly since the 1960s. Then I will read two poems by two contemporary Amazigh poets. So when we talk about Amazigh literature, Amazigh literature, like every literature, has a long history. Uh, every people that exists needs a means of communication, of making sense of their world, of their existence, and conveying the meaning or sense that they make of this existence through language and through artistic expression. And particularly literature as uh, a form of a narrative that focuses on linguistic honing or sharpening of expression and metaphors and all sorts of linguistic tools that are available to a people uh, is really important. And Amazigh people are not any different uh, in that, that they use their language and other languages that they learned to convey this uh, sense of the world or to make sense of their living, of their life, of their environment, of their traditions, of, and construct their identity through narrative. Uh, and as we know, in the post-colonial period, Amazigh language was marginalized and was confined to the home mostly or to remote Amazigh areas where Amazigh spoke their language, they never, they never gave it up. However, before we get to the post-colonial period, it is very important to stress the fact that uh, Amazigh had written in their language and also in other languages 
particularly in Latin, and uh, some important uh, uh, Latin writing today that people study in Christianity, particularly the works of St. Augustine, uh, are originally, who was an originally Amazigh um, priest, is a Amazigh, right? And um, fast forward to the uh, um, conquest of North Africa by Muslims and Arabs in the 8th century, uh, Imazian also learned Arabic, and they used Arabic to make sense of their world. So a lot of the people uh, in uh, North Africa, or Tamazra, as they will explain later, used Arabic language to produce Amazigh literature. So, of course, the distinction here remains whether uh, Amazigh literature can be written in, an, in another language or whether the language in which, uh, in which a literature is written is what gives that literature an identity. Uh, these are open questions. <clears throat> However, what's important for us here is that Amazigh were people who originally spoke to Amazigh or came originally from an Amazigh speaking area, either produced literature in their mother tongue in the Amazigh. Unfortunately, a lot of this literature is lost, uh, and we only have fragments and traces or some references to it. Or they wrote in other languages, as I said, in Latin, with the case of St. Augustine, Apollo, and others. Or they wrote in Arabic, as, as we know, like a lot of the, uh, starting from the 8th century onward, a lot of Imazir learned Arabic and became very strong in writing in Arabic, and they, they produced literature in Arabic. And I think uh, it's very important to get to, to, to kind of like signal this uh, early on. However, what I'm really concerned with is the literature produced in the Amazigh itself, in, in the Amazigh language, which is spoken in North Africa, particularly, or in what Amazigh activists have dubbed or renamed uh, uh, as uh, Tamazra. Tamazra, in the new reconfiguration of the space of North Africa or the Maghrib, uh, as we know it today, extends from the Canary Islands in the Atlantic Ocean to the island of Siwa in southwest Egypt. Uh, so what this vast geographic area shares is Amazigh language. Uh, the, the fact that people either still speak or used to speak Amazigh. And when we say Tamazra, it encompasses the Canary Islands, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, parts of Egypt, and then Chad, Mali, uh, Niger, uh, Senegal, parts of Senegal, and Mauritania. So it's a huge and vast space that, that's home to diff different ethnic groups, uh, and uh, different cultural traditions, but this area used to have as a common language or as a shared language, Tamazigh, that's why it's called Tamazra or the land of Imazigh. And of course, today the conditions have changed. The post colonial situation created nation states and borders between different states lead over, t over time to differences in the way people define words, express themselves, but this does not mean that at some point in time there was no shared language in this, in this homeland. Or at least that's what Amazigh activists actually argue. And uh, starting from the 1990s particularly, with the establishment of the World Amazigh Congress, which is a transnational, transcontinental body or supranational body that brings 
imaziren together both from Tamazgha and the diaspora. And when we think about the post-colonial period and the emergence of Amazigh literature, uh, we cannot really talk about one Amazigh literature because we can talk about different Amazigh literatures which emerged in different cultural and political conditions in the post-colonial period. So the literature that evolved in Algeria or Morocco or the one that emerged in Libya or among the Tuaregs uh, or among the Guanche in, in the Canary Islands are different, uh, both in terms of how they are written, but also in terms of their concerns based on where the people are writing are. Uh, so the Guanche are, are, are Spanish now, and their concerns are more aligned with what's happening in Spain. What's happening in Morocco is different from what's happening in Algeria, for example. And somebody like Saïd Lamharouk, who wrote about Libya, like the first one to really write Amazigh literature in Libya in Arabic, was under Qaddafi's rule, and he paid his life for it. So there is, there, is, there, is, there is an important uh, distinction to be made here. However, I want to come back to the, uh, to the construction of this Amazigh literary field, which I don't think started only from the 1960s or even the 1940s, as some people argue, but rather way long before that. And exactly... Uh, in what Le Mukhtar Susi calls Al-Nahda al or the Amazigh Renaissance, uh, and uh, Amazigh literature being written in, in Arabic or in Arabic letters. Again, but the new Amazigh literature or the Amazigh literature that is conscious of its Amazighity uh, only started in the 1960s and took off particularly in the 1980s and it was written both in French and Arabic letters or Arabic alphabet. Particularly in Algeria, the French, the Latin alphabet was used, but in Morocco, uh, the writers used the um, you know, Arabic alphabet to write Tamazight. And this distinction still continues today, despite, despite the fact that in the 2000s, Tifinagh would, be, would, would start being used more and more among uh, the Amazigh activists. So what does the literary scene look today in Tamazgha? Well, it's very vibrant, it's very rich, it's, it encompasses uh, uh, novels, novelas, short stories, poetry, literal, literal, liter literally all the literary genres that we know in other, in other literary spheres exist in Tamazigh. Uh, there is a very vibrant, very vibrant field of translation from other language into, in, uh, into Tamazigh. There is the production of like uh, theater and plays. People are writing plays and then being played. Uh, people are writing novels. People are writing short stories, novelas, no uh, 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 and, and poetry. O and with the primacy of poetry in certain cases, particularly among uh, the Imazir and Ufsus in Morocco. And this is very normal because sank poetry is really part of the Amazigh life in the Sous. It's, it's, it's very, very, very present. And, to, and Amazigh intellectuals, Amazigh literary figures are asking the same questions that other people ask of literature, like how is this literature conveying the Amazigh sense of identity? How is it contributing to uh, 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 creating a space for social justice, and how is Amazigh literature, as a literature that emerged from struggle for recognition in the post-colonial period, how is it uh, innovating itself to leave the realm of activism? 
to actually enter the realm of aesthetics. Because as some of you may know, uh, in the 1950s, particularly 1956 in Morocco and 1962 in Algeria, when these two countries got their independence from France, the states decided to become Arab Islamist states and they erased Amazir, their Amazir dimension. And this erasure took two forms, the form of marginalization and the form of not teaching the language at school. So this double marginalization led to the absence of the language from the public sphere and it's receding into home and it's be, it, it becoming only a mother tongue that did not have any strong cultural extensions, particularly in cultural production. When in the 1960s, uh, l'Académie Berbère was created in Paris in 1966, and then the Moroccan Association for Exchange and Cultural, uh, for Research and Cultural Exchange was created in Morocco, uh, and a new life was infused in Amazir activism or in the way Tamazir was seen and thought about, and Amazir intellectuals worked really hard to rehabilitate their mother tongue. Of course, this rehabilitation took different aspects. It took a political aspect and a societal aspect and a cultural aspect. And today, what I'm really concerned with is this cultural aspect, because as Amazigh activists work to pressure the politicians and the states to rehabilitate the language, they also work to create resources to document Amazigh heritage, to disseminate the idea that Tamazigh is not an orphan, that it has a literature, a literature, that it is capable of expressing all the goals, of, of, of expressing all the emotions, all the ideas that other languages express. And they work to prove that. And by working to prove that, they themselves, these are activists, they themselves wrote poetry, uh, made translations, and engaged in forms of artistic expression that their training might not have prepared them for. So it's very important in this context to stress the fact that uh, the Amazigh literary field as we know it today was the result of a conscious cultural movement that struggled to rehabilitate the Amazigh language, which was uh, marginalized in the post-colonial period. So today, uh, uh, as I said, there are different um, uh, publishing uh, houses in Morocco and Algeria and in other places that specialize in publishing Amazigh literature. Uh, we have accomplished Amazigh authors uh, from uh, all the Tamazgha. Some of them are writing uh, in Tifinagh, some of them are writing in uh, Latin alphabet, some of them use the Arabic alphabet. Uh, but all of this, instead of being seen as a problem, I personally see it as a, a source of richness and enrichment of the capacity of Tamazigh to evolve and adopt different alphabets, but also what can be expressed by using different alphabets and what it says to us uh, in this regard. One area in which Tamazigh has been struggling and struggling really strongly is translation. And I think uh, it's very important that we open up the, uh, as we would say in French, le chantier, like the, this uh, big project of, of, of translation for people to translate from Tamazigh into English. If you look at like French into English, there is some movement. People are translating from uh, from from uh, Tamazight into French. However, the movement from Tamazight into English is is the, it it it's almost uh, it all it's no, almost non-existent, and uh, it's very important that we 
pay attention to translation because it's through translation that Tamazigh can reach other places, reach other audiences, reach other readers. And also it's through translation that it can acquire an afterlife beyond the geographic space of the Mazra itself, because the uh, Imaziran exist everywhere. They are, there is millions of Imaziran in Europe, uh, thousands in the UK, thousands in the United States, thousands in other parts of the world. And beyond them also, there are readers who are eager to find out about other literatures, about other means of expression, and they think the future of Tamazight as a literature uh, is in this big field of translation that, and that everyone should do what they can to help get Amazigh literature uh, to audiences beyond the borders of, of Tamazgha. Awal by Ali Sidqi Azeiko and it's translated by Habib al into English. Awal. Awal inu gana mazigh urt nisnian usin ur dimik mad izdar nasar sihush. Nikika bdait ya gail awal na rugl iza kan rum gird il sinu dir nukan arukan sawal greater dar urum urmin. Taguri rufan iqan atin girafan. Awal inu gana mazigh urt nirian. كرنان دي قطا ورقيت الدوفلنا اسم دي يدينا هان والراس سورفو كرنان كي جان اد اكتي ووالنون مدن وكين مدن وكين الدق ادن غنك اللي تضمط اولي نوغان مزيغ ران السولرزين الزمزي في السي سرغين غولاون تكات the translation by Habib al goes Language My language is Amazigh, no one knows it It encompasses multitudes Who won't dance and sing in it I'm the only one who worries That my language is hanged Ropes around its neck My tongue is worthless Though it speaks among the deaf it doesn't, it does wear out. The word thirst must surely quench the thirst. My language is Amazigh. Nobody wants it. Some said it's a dream and abandon me. They added, beware, nothing of what has been said will ever be known. Your language remembers a lot and people refuse to feel the same pain as you do. My language is Amazigh. It will shatter the age of silence and set the hearts on fire and become stars then meet in our skies. The poem was written in Rabat in 1978. The other poem uh, is entitled Libdin <coughs> Dunit, The Beginning of Life, and it was written or it's written by Muhammad Zauti, an amazing poet, very abstract, uh, and he is from the region of Warzazat. يمي دبابا تنقشمتي في ناق نقبنتي زران وريز داري أنا تنتمحون يا نزمز غزماز وري فوق العقل ناق تمزيغ تمزيغ تمي قزن نان يسمو تنت وسين دي سموادي قوت نرا تنتمترن أدلي سادا اختنتي نان إزران اختيني اختي نفيغ ونجين يتسن وزالة غيسم للعين وتنتاخت الدان جيوين يقود ما ورتنتي سن نفل غوال الناغ ورنسكير سلوصيات نغال إسكم نسكرا لمزيد نفل كايوال The translation goes by I translated this roughly myself My mother you and my father, each tifinag, written in stone, no one can erase. There was a time that will, need, that will not leave our minds when they were digging a grave for Tamazicht and brought all their tools to bury it. Yet the book told us 
and they found tiffinar in stones. We are not asleep by confused by day ten sleep. The waves of overwhelmed us, yet many did not know. We left our language and heeding ancestral commandments, for we thought it was an accomplishment to give up our language. Uh, as you see, uh, these poems are very different. They come from different, uh, uh, like, uh, poetic uh, ex uh, experiences. Ali Satri, as, as I as I said, was a historian. Was among the first generation of Amazigh uh, poets, literary figures, to have started the Amazigh culture movement and to actually have placed. Tamazight on the map of the nations in North Africa, uh, a, a poet with a huge uh, sensibility uh, and a really strong attention to detail and metaphor. Uh, and Muhammad Zauti is in the later generation. And what's really interesting about Zauti is that he, unlike Ali Azaiku, who went on to enroll in a PhD and he, took, he taught history at the university, uh, Zauti was a former soldier and uh, he, he left the army after being badly injured during uh, the war and he became a poet and he only finished primary school. Uh, and it's amazing also like to see that Zauti's poetry is very abstract. Like he writes a lot about uh, freedom, about nature, about but the imagery is very strong and very uh, infused with the, uh, almost like ex existential questions as they pertain to nature. Uh, uh, and these two poets give us uh, just like a glimpse of the richness and the depth of uh, Amazigh poetry. And of course, the translations are, are rough because they are not like uh, finished yet and uh, they are still a work in progress. But they hope that they give the audience an idea about what's possible to do with Amazigh literature and the possibility of opening up this field of translation for Amazigh literature to reach the world and to reach bigger audiences and to speak to different experiences, particularly experiences of indigeneity and how other indigenous people all over the world have expressed or, and conveyed this sense of disposition, powerlessness and rejection. Uh, and both poems that I chose today actually talk about language, right? One of them talks about the sense of rejection and being uh, repressed and not being given the possibility to speak his language or being told that his language is a dream and that it's limited and it cannot express anything or everything. And then 40 years later, or less than 40 years actually, uh, like three decades later, Zauti comes and he brings back the Tifinach, which becomes the, uh, the symbol of Amazigh identity in later years, and says that it's written in stone, and that everything that has been tried to erase this marker of Amazigh identity in North Africa has failed because Amazigh have been able to go back to the rock, to the stone where this language is written in stone and reconstruct it, recover it. And one of the really deepest things that I found in this poem and that drew me to it personally is when he talks about how at some point they were digging a grave for the language and they declared it dead. Uh, however, uh, and, and they brought all the tools that they needed to bury it, but then consciousness happens and people recover the language. But before he gets to that, he of course says that how Imaziran were overwhelmed by this sense of this position and then they decided, some of them at least, decided to give up their language and uh, enter, as to use Katibiasin's phrase, the wolf's mouth, and uh, you know, you know what happens when uh, you you lose your language and you lose your sense of identity. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think um, Amazigh literature is very vibrant and uh, very rich, and its potential for translation is really there. And I think that collaborations between people and 
uh, like accomplished translators and I'm going to make this a reality. So thank you very much for the invitation and I hope you enjoy the poetry and the rest of the festival. Thank you. To speak of Hyperion is to also speak of Contramundum Press, because Hyperion predates the publishing house and is the source out of which it emerged. As may be discernible from its name, Hyperion, on the future of aesthetics, it is in principle a hybrid amalgamation of Herdelin and Nietzsche, two pole stars out of which a volatile Ars Poetica was shaped. By volatility, what is meant is chemical mutability. What is at work here is essentially a relation to the entirety of history, to traditions, to the artistic lineages within which we exist and move outward or away from. If embracing volatility, this ars poetica can be conflictual and contestatory, an art, a writing that is agonistic and rife with positive tension like the precise tautness of a bow, a violin string, or the spring tension and pivot screws of a saxophone. Without such perfect tension, no music, no poetry can be made. Although the word volatile has a predominantly violent connotation in our era, in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, it meant that which was fine or light, evaporating rapidly, from the French volatile, from the Latin volatilis, meaning fleeting, transitory, swift, rapid, flying, winged. So that which flies. Volatiles in Middle English meant birds, butterflies, and other winged creatures. In this movement, in the action of a volatile Ars Poetica, there is a flight beyond the merely local, the nationalistic, to something outside. It is a movement beyond the constricted locale even of the body, ergo outside cloistering subjectivities, to other atmospheres, to even that which is planetary, if not cosmic, to multiverses. That is, for those who seek to be truly expansive, and if one understands the necessity of moving beyond metaphysics, which is to move beyond anthropocentrism to that which is animal, botanical, geological, and so on. In Herdelin's time, the pathway to exceptional artistic achievement was made by way of imitating the model of the ancient Greeks, exemplified in Winckelmann's dictum that the sole means for art to become inimitably great, if possible, is in the imitation of the ancients. Although greatly revering the ancient Greeks, Herdelin was agonistic in spirit, and while embodying that ancient heritage, culture foreign to his own, and others, one of the things his play The Death of Empedocles conveys, as do his essays, is to never inhabit dead forms. Speaking of the threat of the past and of our relation to it, Herdelin saw two paths, we seem, he said, really to have almost no other option, either to be crushed beneath the weight of the received and the positive, or with a violent presumption to pit oneself as a living force against everything learned, given, and positive. What is being wrestled with here is the question of the spirit of humanity and its manifestation which Herder and others saw palingenetically as that which flourishes and progresses through different cultures across the earth over time. For Herdelin, self-knowledge entails moving outside the local and incorporating the foreign, and this is reflected even in his view of translation. 
Translation, he said, does our language good, like gymnastics. It gets beautifully supple when forced to accommodate itself thus to foreign beauty and greatness, and also often to foreign whims. This is not appropriation, but ingestation, cross-pollination. Nietzsche poses related questions in his essay on the uses and disadvantages of history for life, wherein he observes that when history becomes monumental, it constricts and strangles us. Empty emulation is not the pathway, but the creation of new values through competition, through an agon with the past, through an agon with all of history, whereby all of the old tablets are shattered to create a new civilization. A similar but even more extreme ethos or transvaluation of values is found in Artaud, who is a secret double, an energetic force behind Hyperion. To Artaud, even the library at Alexandria can be burnt down. But this revolutionary proposal is not that of a fearful and destructive tyrant who sees what is foreign as something degenerate against which one must inoculate oneself to conserve some illusory notion of purity. To the incendiary figure of the plague, there are forces above and beyond papyrus. We may temporarily be deprived of our ability to discover these forces, but their energy will not be suppressed. It is good that our excessive facilities are no longer available, that forms fall into oblivion, a culture without space or time, restrained only by the capacity of our own nerves, will reappear with all the more energy. It is right that from time to time cataclysms occur that compel us to return to nature, i.e. to rediscover life. True culture, Artaud declares, operates by exaltation and force. That, ultimately, is the call of Hyperion and Contramundum Press, to seek the capacity of our own nerves, to return to nature in this sense, not a la Rousseau, to rediscover life, to operate with our own exaltation and force, and the exaltation of, and force of elements and atmospheres. This not only involves entering others, as well as others entering, altering, and mutating us, it also involves other entities, such as geological, botanical, oceanic, and cosmic ones, entering us, so as to preserve us from localities, from any sense of purity, and from an all-too-limiting and dangerous anthropomorphism. Clearly, this is something that will not always be realized, or rarely, but that is inconsequential. As Rimbaud said, the supreme savant arrives at the unknown. If, when bewildered, such a figure ends up losing understanding of its visions, at least they have been seen. And it doesn't matter if such leaps into the unknown will kill the savant. Other awful workers will follow afterward, starting at the horizons where the previous ones have fallen. So, in the midst of our potential terror or paralyzation before the immeasurable continuum of the past, where all creativity becomes crisis, the muteness of the white page, our aim is to embody, to alter ourselves and move beyond into alien territory. There is no life, no language even, without the lineages from which we emerge. But we cannot be suffocated or closed off by them. More, they are expansive enough to welcome alien forms, whether human or otherwise, such as the botanical, the geological, the animal, etc. And it is the future that we call with new forms, with new interpretations of reality as we signal through the flames of the past, which is either that which burns and incinerates us, or that out of which new technologies and poetics are forged.
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Paul Spaulding Moncock. I'm a literary features writer for the Yorkshire Times uh, and I'm also a freelance developmental editor. Um, I very much hope you're enjoyed, enjoying uh, um, St. Jordi, um, wherever you are. Um, in terms of today's chat, uh, I've recently written an eight episode exploration of Catalan literature in collaboration with the literary translator Tiago Miller. Um, you can find that at www.yorkshiretimes.co.uk and that has very much catalyzed my nascent passion for Catalan literature um, and its scribes um, and that has led me to be uh, invited very kindly um, to give a brief overview of uh, an often overlooked um, uh, member of the, the creative community, Pepe Salas, a poet, a singer, songwriter, um, and uh, of course, painter. Um, so without further ado, let's get on with it. I'm going to be reading from notes uh, and apologies for my appalling pronunciation. Um, I'll do my level best. So Pepe Salas uh, was born in Barcelona in 1954. He died in 1994, age 39, having uh, succumbed to HIV AIDS, which was first diagnosed in 1988. Um, his colourful life was marked by drug use, his sexuality, um, Francoist prison and revolutionary utopia. Um, his literary roots and his formative years uh, are hugely significant, uh, if you like the creative winds uh, filling his, uh, his, his undaunted uh, sails. He was the nephew uh, of, of the uh, very famous uh, Joan uh, Salas, who obviously was a close collaborator with uh, Merce Roderada. Um, and he was also a nephew of the painter Gaeta Salas. Um, so he's got strong literary roots, that's the point I'm trying to make. He was also um, the eighth of 11 siblings that came from a he, and he came from a very strict uh, Christian family. And I'd go as far as to suggest that he was a bit of a cuckoo in the nest, um, which is which is quite important to bear in mind when you look at his oeuvre in totality. Um, he turned to drugs to battle his own demons, um, which, as you as you know, was 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 common uh, in the 1980s, late late 70s, early 80s. It swept through Catalan and, and, and obviously across Spain and was was beautifully and brutally uh, expressed by Jordi Cusa in uh, Wild Horses, translated by my friend Tiago. Um, but as I said, he turned to drugs, ended up in prison in Barcelona for possession of hashish, um, and ultimately um, he turned to heroin in about 1975, and again became a lifelong addict, and it really was a burden he carried throughout his short years. Um, in 1979, Salas came out as homosexual to his family and friends um, with mixed sympathy. Um, and I think another point to make is that during his short but intensely creative life, um, he wrote and performed songs, he painted prodigiously, and he wrote poetry. Uh, his 50 songs about love was published shortly uh, before his death um, and, and and it's it's a remarkably um, powerful body of work but it's like so much of his writing it's all we've really got um, he only published one book we only have one book if you like um, the gospel according to Pepe Salas which was published by Le Brew. Um, and in fact that's the source of Tiago Miller's translations before we go on to his actual work, um, it's probably useful to talk about his legacy. It's very difficult with this particular creative. I, I use the word osmotic um, in so much as he's not particularly well known, um, largely because of the finite nature of the work, the body of work, um, but also because I don't think he particularly wanted to be a celebrity. His authenticity, his creative afflatus, if you like, drew him to stay at the epicenter of what he was doing and he wasn't really that interested in, in uh, um, gaining a broad reputation so it's difficult for us to assess his legacy beyond saying that it's probably fair to say he liberated many in the sense of uh, 
defying normative um, constraints and having the confidence to freely uh, express him, themselves. Um, a kind of a punkish image, if you like. Um, Salas, I've, I've said, contributed to Catalan culture and in a myriad of, of, of multifaceted ways, but broadly speaking, we're looking at art, uh, we're looking at poetry and we're looking at uh, uh, prose and we're looking at music. If we look at his art first, um, broadly, I think it's possible to say that uh, it's abstract expressionism. Again, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an umbrella term. Hyperion's winter edition 2022, um, actually the, the, the literary magazine, um, showcases at the centre of its 70 page volume. Uh, which I heartily recommend you engage with. Um, a lot of, uh, I think there are 10 images, in fact, of, of, of Salas's. It's actually a Catalan special. Um, and Pepe Salas, uh, some of his poetry uh, is, is indeed translated by Tiago Miller. And you can, you can engage with these images if you go to Hyperion um, and, and have a look. To my untrained eye, his work is, is like so much of his creative outpourings, uh, the response to turbulent social times he, he, he sort of inhabited. Um, I see a fusion of elements uh, coalescing, if you like, at the centre of uh, his creative energies. Um, I pick up Audrey Beardsley, I pick up um, elements of Toulouse-Lautrec, albeit not quite as comic. Um, there's Picasso, uh, there's a bit of pointed whimsy, but, but edging more towards darkness than whimsy, I suppose. The, 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 the influence of Dali, or maybe even the remembrance or, or whatever of Dali might be in there as well. He seems to use mural techniques, it seems to be in pasto, um, it seems to convey unbridled energy and vitality. And as with surrealism itself, uh, to me, it seems to be both a protest and, and a, a kind of a, a metaphysical confession. We see elements of impressionistic uh, um, tropes, uh, I suppose is, is a good way to say. Um, there are nudes drawn with minimal adherence to line and minimal observation of classical form. Uh, it's almost a Cezanne-esque counterpointing of blocks of colour um, with contrasts and, and sympathetic colours. Um, we see a very unusual use of chiaroscuro. So this is not Caravaggio's chiaroscuro. This is, this is a kind of a dirty realist chiaroscuro. So you'll have an image and a, a black background, or you might have the opposite of that. Um, and it reminds me personally of Freda Kahlo um, in, in the sense of we're seeing a kind of an external depiction of an internal conflict or pain or message um, rendered as a, 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 as a painting. Uh, so it's, it, it really is a transference, if you like, uh, through art of his psyche into our psyche. Um, now, I'm not an art critic and I'm a pretty poor literary critic. Um, so don't take my words for it. Uh, go and engage, if you will, with his art and, 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 and make your own mind up. Moving swiftly on to his his music, um, I think it's it's fair to say, and again, forgive the pronunciation, but uh, it's marked aesthetically by Rimbaud, uh, Pasolini, Keith Richards, William Burroughs, uh, and a very heavy nod to Lou Reed. In 1984, he formed the rock group uh, Boca Negra with his friend, the poet and translator, uh, Victor Obios. And Obios defines Salas as, and I'll quote, gifted with an extraordinarily special energy. I think he might have been talking about his charisma and also his intensity. Um, Salas became the group's intellectual mentor and, and, and ideologue and he managed them, but he also wrote the lyrics. Um, and I think if you explore the lyrics, both listening to them and reading them, they are very biographical. You can, you can find out who Salas was by listening to his music. He was also heavily influenced by uh, Velvet Underground, Andy Warhol, um, and as I said just moments ago, um, Lou Reed is, is there. It, his music, another key point, um, his music came from a period of social and cultural upheaval and unrest. You know, this is the, the period uh, just after the death of Franco. So, you know, 
we, we've got untrammeled challenging of normative prescriptive behaviors and we've got Salas voicing both his own uh, internal angst and his, 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 his concerns, maybe a generation's concerns, maybe that's why people connected with it. Um, even the, the godlike Albert Pla plays a part in, in, in Salas's story. Uh, and I don't think you can find uh, a finer accolade really. Pla met Salas in 2003, did an album based upon his poetry um, I've already quoted that. Uh, and Salas also put some of his poems to music. So we have two versions of, of his poetry. And if we think of Pla and his kind of, I suppose, uh, impossible to define blending of uh, dramaturgy and, and music, the fusion of stylistic tropes, the very personal uh, delivery of, of authentic thoughts, messages from the heart, um, you get an intuition of what Salas's music is, is, is like. Like Pla, um, Salas fused traditional Spanish and Catalan traditions to produce um, what I believe is called La Rumba Catalana, uh, delivering his, his highly personal lyrics with both a kind of a rock-driven passion um, and the intellectual nuance of, of what was clearly a you know, very, very sensitive man. And like his poetry, his music's full of syncopated rhythms. It's heavily accented downbeats, but there's space for charisma and there's space for pain and there's space for reflection. And they, they, they tango, they dance together. Um, these clips can be found on YouTube and Spotify and, and I, I recommend you go and listen to them. They, they are magical uh, and moving. Um, turning to his poetry and prose, um, I've mentioned that Tiago Miller, the literary translator, is responsible for giving uh, us, amongst the many gems that he is, has, has been behind, Montserrat Roig's uh, marvellous The Song of Youth and Geordie Coos's wildly original uh, uh, take on the, the 80s heroin epidemic, one that he lived through. He was a DJ, he was an addict, and uh, one believes that he, he was the first person to write a serious account of what that period was like. But Tiago um, was was invited by uh, Hyperion, who I've mentioned, to contribute to their Winter 22 collection, um, which is, as I said, a, it's focusing on Catalan literature. And at the centre of it, we've not only got Salas's paintings, but we've got um, poems translated by Tiago from 50 Songs About Love. In the introduction, Tiago tells us uh, quite a lot, and I'm going to quote from Tiago. Pepe Salas was the complete artist, painter, singer, writer, poet, enfant terrible. The sweating, suffering and sweet talking all form part of the spontaneous creative process. He liked the best music, the best literature, the best drugs. He read and listened to whatever he could get his hands on, and he loved Dylan. He loved Lou Reed, The Rolling Stones, Giovanni Pugolesi, R.W. Fassbender, Ayrton Senna, Cameron, Nostrad Fato, Henry Miller, Anis Nin, Proust, Miles Davis, Samuel Beckett. So it's again building our picture. Here, here's a highly sensitive intellectual that is culture hungry, feeding perhaps a slightly damaged soul, but nonetheless feeding it with nutrition and then expressing it in his own unique um, and indefinable way, really. His words reflect his life, the warts and all. They're, they're like all of his, his art. They, they, they were completely unflinching expressions of his truth. They're marked by candor, irreverence, um, perseverating, tenacious, imperative need to tell it as it is. Um, his voice is non-standard. Uh, it's, it's, it's modernist, in my opinion, up to a point. Um, it's dirty realism before dirty realism was a thing. Um, and it's surfing on the inherently musical rhythms that I think kind of permeate his psyche. His prose reminds me of Geordi Cusa um, in that it's, it's got a plasticity, but it's got a realism to it. Um, and the poetry seems to me to be almost kind of Dylan-esque, um, Lou Reed infused song lyrics that have been given um, a kind of poetic form. I'm going to read um, an extract from his 1979 diary as translated by um, Tiago. And this passage lifts the carpet 
if you like, on on the man um, who lived in the shadows when he wasn't performing. And when he did perform, it was always in intimate, dark, subterranean settings. Again, a man that did not live in the sunshine. But again, this passage that I'm, I'm going to read is context. Um, so this is a quote. Uh, I've sweated. He's, he's waiting for his, his pusher to give him drugs. And he's in a filthy apartment. And this is what he says about the situation. I sweated through the dressing gown I had to put on leaving the cushions soaking wet three quarters of an hour that goddamn pusher one hour late the anxiety is gargantuan all i want is to kill the idiotic depressed lucidity making me weep over anything i want warmth in my bones and to calm the rampant pain in my shoulders it's getting ugly now but hell the first thing you learn is that you always gotta wait as lou reed sang later uh, he recalls being taken to a psychiatric department at, at, at a hospital clinic in, in Barcelona. And he recalled how um, the doctor there had no idea that, I quote, junkies use Tilly to calm the trembling turkey. And he laments um, uh, the, uh, the default edict of uh, the doctors to undergo a rehab program. Writing, and I'll quote again now, writing means leaving which, sorry, which means leaving you goofballed the first three days with your testicle, clormeth as old yellow. He goes on to recall how his friend Victor, a fellow addict, was forced to undergo rehab. And he writes cynically uh, and bitterly about those supposed, supposedly helping. And here's another passage. The invalid doesn't mean shit to them. There are a few lines of business that can charge you more than 3,000 pesetas for a two-minute consultation while staying on a ward twice as expensive as sleeping at the Ritz and don't expect a cent from Social Security. At the end of the day, uh, he was going there every week for a spot of... And he's talking about Victor now. He's going there every day of the week for a spot of substitutional treatment to pay a fortune and end up socially disgraced, which the Frank Francoist social dangers law took good care of. Now for context, Victor committed suicide. His friend committed suicide that Christmas. And this is what Salas had to say. But of course, if they'd handed him a prescription, he wouldn't have come back. And that's a lot of cash those murderers would have missed out on. Salas ends his diary note by uh, attacking the profession uh, of his own land for not handing out these these prescriptions, for their lack of sympathy, um, as 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 was the case in so he says advanced countries, and here's the quote: "Because they have already been and seen too many dead victors." So it's pretty pretty dark stuff. Um, I'm going to read you one of his poems before I I finish up. This one is called Christ of the Pharmacies, and as I said, it comes from uh, the collection that was published shortly before his death. It's as follows. Christ of the Pharmacies. Forgive me, my Lord. I'm begging you, please. I'm down on my knees. It's me, my Lord. How could I be so blind on the corner at night beneath the neon light? Is it you, my Lord? Forgive me, my Lord. We felt so much pain, but again and again, you forsook us, my Lord. Now we're paying the price, stung up like Christ. No more passion, please. It's me, my Lord. Christ of the pharmacies, tell the man to give us relief and serve us our daily poison, or take the cross down the street. So again, what we've got there is uh, Salas really uh, pointing out his, his, his grief and his pain. So um, I mentioned Hyperion. Hyperion, the edition is um, Hyperion on the Future of Aesthetics, Volume 1, uh, number 15, number, Volume 15, Number 1, the Winter Edition 2022. It's a paperback edited by Raina Hansch and Erica Milhaska, um, published by Contra Mundum Press. Um, very interestingly, uh, here's a quote from them. They are a home to lone and often exiled and eclipsed voices which hover at margins and thresholds, if not beyond and outside them. Contramundum serves as the home to world culture, welcoming voices, and so the lives and experiences of foreigners. I think that's a fitting place for 
Pepe Salas to be. Um, he's on the margin or is he at the epicentre? Either way, he's not in the spotlight and he should be. He's a voice that we need to listen to. He's a, his paintings need to be engaged with. He is uh, an artist who cannot be pigeonholed. He is an artist responding with authenticity, creativity, innovation, and most of all, with his heart, um, not over overruled by his intellect. He's a, a very, very important and interesting person um, and a major contributor in my humble opinion to Catalan literature. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that chat um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Saint Jordi. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello, my name is Marianne Newman and I am one of the curators of the uh, Saint Jordi USA uh, Festival of Books, Roses and Dragons. But Right now I'm here because I'm also one of the translators of this wonderful special issue of Hyperion magazine devoted to Catalan culture. And I have a piece in here by Eugenie Dors, who is a writer who's lived from 1881 to 1954. And he, in 1906, he began writing daily newspaper articles in La Veu de Catalunya, The Voice of Catalonia, which was one of the important uh, newspapers of the time. And his articles um, would often take, take off from a, from a little detail, and from there he would create a whole worldview. And he called this a turning uh, anecdote into category. And it was supposed to be a, a, a kind of brief lesson of philosophy, he called himself a household philosopher. and But they were written with such style and panache that people actually, um, it would be the first thing they would turn to when they, when they picked up the paper. In fact, it was on the first page, so that wasn't hard. But, but he, he had a great influence on Catalan society through these articles. And in 1911, he started on, during the summer, he decided to devote one of these articles every day. They were called glossos. He would divide, devote a gloss every day to, it was, he wrote a novel, a novel, a serial novel uh, called La Bem Plantada, The Stately Lady. And so every day there was a chapter of the novel and people were following this novel um, through throughout the summer and very excited about what was happening and speculating about who this woman was and all of this because it seemed to be slightly close to what his summer might be like. So anyway, the, that was 1911. In 1912 that book came out and people, it, it was a bestseller. And then in 1915, of course, the World War II was in progress, he wrote it, he called these novels, these summer novels, vacations, his vacations. So in 2015, he devoted his vacation novel to um, Gualba of the Thousand Voices, Gualba la de Mil Veos. And this novel was a, a cry of despair for the way the war had plunged the perfect 20, 20th century culture into, into chaos. And Orr's considered, he wrote a novel about a father and daughter who go to a mountain village, Gualba, to translate King Lear. And so he uses the kind of hidden incest theme of King Lear to talk about being thrust back into a state of nature um, and leaving culture behind. So he's actually making reference to the incest, in Freud's incest taboo or the or the anthropological notion that civilization is born when incest is prohibited. So, fortunately, in 1917, he decided to publish a much more um, sanguine novel, a very beautiful novel. There's always a tension between nature and culture in his novels, and this it's also in this one, but the novel is, is it's fun. It's called Oceanography of Tedium, and I don't think I need to give it a preamble because it's very clear um, 
what it's about. Oceanography, Oceanography of Tedium. Introduction. The Sentence. The doctor is an old friend. The doctor is an old fox. The doctor knows one's foibles. The doctor has handed down his sentence. I am not prescribing the countryside. I am not prescribing repose. Author, author, man in perpetual evolution. I know only too well your, how you construe countryside and repose. I am prescribing, as your only salvation, tedium. Tedium to the letter. Unattenuated, unnuanced tedium. No excursions, chaise longue. No conversations, silence. No reading, lethargy. Insofar as it is possible, not one movement, not one thought. The author gave his word and took his leave. The author rose to the challenge. Even more than his instinct for survival, he was depositing his self-esteem in the perfectly faithful, scrupulous, extreme compliance with the prescription. Now the full magical extent of his destiny would be revealed. That life that had taken the garden of fever to its maximum intensity would now reach, for a time, to the human limits of extenuated inertia. Not one movement, not one thought. It was half past three in the afternoon, a park encircled by beautiful trees, a lounge chair in the most elusive and recondite corner, loose tennis whites half covering his reclining body. Above, between two cedars, a stretch of hotel wall, a windowless side wall, an unbroken stretch of white. Amidst the sun's reverberation upon the white wall thunders the onerous sentence, not one movement, not one thought. Chapter two, the nap. To close one's eyes, to sleep, that was the banal solution. At, the time, at this time of day, the garden abounds with lounge chairs. Some of them discreetly dissemble. Others come together to share their indolence, their heedless, negligent conversation. The open, warped book no longer read. And that willfully unproductive oscillation of the hands that the gentle ladies call fancy work. And that other oscillation, that other fancy work that everyone has come to call flirting. A wave of heat lies heavy upon the park, which lies low as if in a basin. Above the park, only the artful, luxurious vegetation manages to mask the raging rays of the sun. It is the hour of the nap. To sleep. Has the author per perchance fallen asleep? He does not know. His eyes are now obstinately fixed on the white wall of the sentence. His first conscious act is to read it, not one movement, not one thought. His second act, to take notice of a small, slight flash to the right that comes to pierce his eye with its tiny reflex. Said eye turns very slowly toward that side as the body remains immobile. The flash comes from a tea teaspoon half lying on its side. Under the teaspoon, there is a cup. Under the cup, a portable coffee table. Farther on, atop the portable coffee table, a sugar cube. And atop the sugar cube, a fly. How fascinating is this fly. Author closes his eyes again. He remembers. It was he who called for the coffee table to be placed by the side of the chaise longue. He has had a cup of coffee. Perhaps he has also smoked a cigarette. His memory cannot certify it. Vaguely, dully, he felt the desire to do so. Perhaps he still holds the spent cigarette between his fingers, but his hand is too far away, and now his turbid consciousness knows nothing of the pressures on his hand. If he were to look, but to look, to look and to see, one must raise one's head or raise one's hand. The author's lucidity spirals, 
and he loses himself for a moment in the subtleties of the choice. A feat of decisiveness leads him to prefer the small gesture of raising his hand, but the slight elevation has caused his flaccid fingers to separate. Then, obscurely, he perceives some weightless thing escaping, escaping. The ear hears a tenuous sound coming from the ground, tenuous as a muffled sigh. The eye, then, has been freed of the burden of opening. Yes, there had been a half-smoked cigarette there. Chapter 3. The author sinks into the sea. Light was the sound of the cigarette falling. This sound is louder. Once again, his eye indolently turns to where the coffee table sits. Now, beyond the table, a waiter stands stiffly, and the waiter says, Do you have any more need of this? The uncomprehending eye looks him up and down. The question is repeated. Do you have any more need of this? Not a word, but an obscure grumble responds, No, no. The waiter still seems to be awaiting something, but the author definitely does not understand. The other man moves away. In one hand, the coffee table held aloft. In the other, the gleaming coffee surface, service. Now the author is like a shipwrecked man adrift in mid-sea, whose hands have released the rope that held him, his last hope of holding fast. Having coffee is still some kind of action, so long as the coffee table was there, he was having coffee. Now he was not. He has allowed the last trace of his active life to be taken away. He closes his eyes again. He has lost all his moorings. Now he sinks, solitary and abandoned, into tedium. He sinks into tedium, just as a shipwrecked man sinks into the sea. So... I really love this book, um, and I love in that chapter that the waiter is standing there waiting for a tip, <laughs> and the author doesn't understand him. But it's, so that is kind of a um, a sample of the of the gentle humor that Eugenie Dors uses in in his writing, and um, and well, we're just going to have to find a publisher to publish the rest of it. There are a few more chapters in Hyperion. I also encourage you to buy Hyperion magazine. It, right now, Reiner Hansha, the editor, has included um, Anna, Anna Gual, Felicia Fuste, uh, Xavier Cravioto, um, Pepe Salas, and translators um, uh, Anne Kaiser, uh, Maria, Maria Elena Carr, um, James Hawley, and I can't remember the fourth, but buy the magazine. It's really good. All right. Happy San Jordi. Hello, I'm Dr. A. Kaiser, and today I'd like to speak to you a bit about the fascinating Sabria Montelieu. First of all, I'd like to thank the San Jordi Festival team for this gathering and celebration, as well as Hyperion Magazine, which has published some of my work on Montelieu. I discovered Montelieu, urbanista by trade, when I began my dissertation on the first translations into French and Spanish of Walt Whitman. I worked with the poet, translator, and professor emeritus, Francis Pasorizas, and was readily tipped off to Montelieu's own 1909 translation of 24 poems of Lise of Grasse. Montelieu and his life and work quickly overtook my own. Today, I will read you a bit about his life, his entourage, and um, excerpt from the preface of his Walt Whitman, The Man and His Work from 1913. Sabria Montelieu, born in Palma, 1873, and died in Albuquerque, 1923, at the um, 50 years old, was an integral player of 19th to 20th centuries Catalan, European, and U.S. histories. 
bringing the era's scientific, social, and cultural ideas to Catalans and to the wider world. Montelier traveled Europe in search of urban planning best practices and forefronted city gardens in rapidly industrializing Barcelona to ensure the creation of green democratic spaces throughout the city, a city for which he envisioned economic growth walking in step with quality of life for all. On the literary front, from 1903 to 1913, Montelieu was the first translator of Cat into Catalan of Shakespeare's Macbeth, as well as texts by Ruskin, Emerson, and Whitman, following his translations of Whitman's poems by his work, Walt Whitman, the man in his work. Therein, he surprisingly, given the era, considers the sexual question and includes an astute reflection on the influence of Quakerism on the poet, all the while conceiving Whitman as an organic poet. He came from a well-educated multilingual family and the males in the family were participants in the most influential cultural and political circles of their times. His father in 1873, for example, was arguing for universal access to clean drinking water. His siblings included Manuel de Montelieu, top literary critic and translator of Dante in Goethe, Frances, translator of Buddhist texts and active in Paris and Madrid with the Theosophical Society. Placide, the musicologist who was in New York with Sebria and who is, he is credited with bringing Deleuze's Eurythmics to the U.S. The one female Montelieu of which I have been able to learn something is the sister Pilar, who published a poetry collection on the eve of her taking religious vows. In short, Montelieu was a man both of and at the avant-garde, a transatlantic thinker, and worthy, I believe, of the biography I'm writing on him. Now for some excerpts from his preface to Walt Whitman, the man in his work. No matter the extent to which one is an enemy of critical commentary, when it comes to truly inspired writing, one must admit that Whitman's too demands it. The work itself perhaps lacks any higher merit than that of a poetic memorandum of an essentially poetic life, but at the same time, it contains lines full of meaning, meaning palpably spilling from each word, producing off-balance forms and types of disorientated expression resulting in thus enigmatic verses for those who are unaware of the great spirit that dictated them. Further on, Contemporary history testifies that Whitman, even after his death, not only conquers, but continues to provoke his critics. To this day, as in the past, there are ferocious attacks by those evoking both his life and his work. <clears throat> Every time some daring translator, author, or editor gives themselves a license to bring them forth, either to the public as in Italy, Germany, or France, or 30 years ago when Whitman began to be known in English-speaking countries. Further, it's not for nothing that Catalonia is said to be the America of Spain, and it was thanks to that that, this, that our ancient vessel of human freedom was the first of the Hispanic languages to greet the noble cries and generosity with which the great bard of democracy wanted to sing the heart of America and with that of the world. Thank you. Happy San Jordi! I'm Mary Elena Carr and I'm going to share some translations from the poetry of Felicia Fuste. In the legend, San Jordi, a knight, rescues a woman from a dragon. We don't run into very many dragons these days, but who are we kidding? We face huge collective dangers like climate change and political violence and personal perils like losing somebody we love or illness. The poet Felicia Fuste tells us that as long as we have words, we have power, and that we don't need anybody to come rescue us. She speaks from experience. She was born in Barcelona in 1921. This was a generation whose lives were marked indelibly by wars. After graduating fine arts, she was quite active in the art scene of Spain at the time, but these were very difficult moments, and she moved to France, to Paris, in 1951, where she would reside until her death in 2012. There she made a living primarily as a business person, but she never stopped painting, and she continued to exhibit and show her art. 
After retirement, she traveled extensively and she never stopped painting and she continued to show her art. And also she began to sh share her poems with the world. This first poem that I'm going to share with you today is an incantation. I'll read it first in Catalan and then in English. Invocaré l'asfalt de l'ombra, les dents que com les pedres es podreixen, els nombres cabalístics de la pell vençuda, els morts ressuscitats i sense crani, els deus perduts i grocs, la meva sang que res detura, i més, perquè retrobis la llum estesa de la tarda. L'espai secret on estrelles novícies i blanques es despullen, les abelles del vent, la mel dels núvols. I així aprenguis, quasi sol, a existir amb ferros a les ungles. Invocaré la sal assedegada, la pols d'olurc que es cansa i cau, les platges amb centuris, llegues i mudes que s'esperen en va per a lligar-nos, el cant tossut dels gris que s'extasien amb la celístia falsa de la ciutat que veia. I tot ho donaré i tot per res, només per veure't viure. Quina falera estranya fa que m'ho jugui tot als daus d'un cor enderrocat, sabent que encara que guanyés, tot l'haig de perdre. I'll call forth the asphalt of the shadows, teeth crumbling like stones into gravel, the cabalistic numbers of defeated skin, the risen dead who have no skulls, the lost and yellow gods, my unstoppable blood and more. So you may find again the drawn out light of the afternoon, the secret space where novice white stars undress, the wind bees, the honey of clouds. And so you learn, almost alone, how to get by with irons for fingernails. I'll call forth the bone-thirsty salt, the dust of pride that tires and falls, the beaches of a hundred eyes, dull and speechless, waiting without hope to tie us down, the relentless singing crickets enthralled to the bogus starlight of the city that never sleeps. And I will give it all, and all for nothing, just to see you live. What strange obsession has me play it all on the dice roll of a heart, racked and ruined, knowing that even if I were to win, I am to lose it all. This next poem is a sestina, which is a very long and very hard poem to write. In it, she tells an alternate San Jordi story, one, a post-apocalyptic one, as if you will. So this is a woman not held captive by a dragon, no, by a skeleton shadow, the bone of flames, and a Mardi Gras king of scrap metal. She's in a walled circle on a swamp, and it's dark, and there is grief. And she gets out without a knight to rescue her. Through the delusions, the lies that we're constantly hearing to buy into falsehoods. And now I know myself a mirror, opaque. I breathe in and out, deep, full in the circle. My blood, a cast off sweet, all emptied of flames, shatters the neutrons, the cells, the delusions, and makes me deaf, as deaf as a, a scrap metal of the days that lie rusting among the ropes. The sunlight stripped away from them is just ropes draping over my body inside the opaque hand dreamt up by the tap, tap of scrap metal from worn out and emptied time in the circle. Below the grief, root braiding, the delusions, the skeleton shadow and the bone of flames are discussing the world. And amidst the flames, they launch me full tilt by tightening the ropes to a zigzag blade of a thousand delusions fastening me inside the night. And still opaque, heart ripped out, to find the key to the circle, my ragged fingers claw through the scrap metal. Though I deny the walls and the scrap metal confining me, sightless, deep inside the flame, that crisps and widens the tear in the circle, 
I'm a single point without a word. The ropes keep swinging me off balance, far into the opaque, sticky clay that is the old page of delusions, almost become stars of flint. The delusions, like wide open jaws, wake up the scrap metal, hungrily waiting for me, a jonquil opaque, brittle as paper enveloped in the flame atop the vague swamp. I won't look through the ropes that rot there for the strut to breach the circle. No, like a jester, I'll pull from the circle, water clocks brimming liquid of delusions to crumble from within the hours and the ropes, the living Mardi Gras king of scrap metal, and bring light to the shadows, even as the flame makes me within my voice, Hosanna so opaque. Crickets cast spells, so flame, sky, and delusions will swallow the opaque night of the circle and the scrap metal left keening over the ropes. This next poem is a little bit less action-packed, but still there is the appearance of a large predator, a cameo, not a dragon. I leave you the jug of memories, beaded with afternoon. Don't make me wait for toothless steps or idle cloud bursts. I want to go. I still have the hours. I know the houses will fall on me in a heartbeat. I'm a needle bent from so many mended streets, now with no thread. No lineage tugs me from behind. I want to go. The great door of the world hangs askew. Hunger, death that can't be explained. Not by the asphalt of steamy streets not by the dust. First, let me wash in the clear bubble of your faraway gaze, so that later you're not afraid. I leave you a jug, who knows filled with what, so that you're not thirsty if some lion walks by. These poems take a very personal nature. And this one, which is quite sad, it's a woman who is stuck and she can't escape. There's no leaving. She's very defiant about refusing to reside in memory lane, in her memories. She speaks of the cold of the live-in. Never. I have no watch, no destination. I'm cold. In my frozen flower pot, no words grow to wrap me. Only the great desert of those mute telegrams from the oracles or the shipwrecked. The laughing passport doesn't dream up the rigging for my travels anymore. Just like the color pencil, useless against my white stockings. I'll have to leave, indeed, on foot. The train, grasping as ivy, hasn't come. So be it. If someone saw me walking memory lane, i tell them, stop me. Tell me what I am not, what I no longer carry. I have no watch, no destination, no milk handkerchief, no apple sky. My feet are dropping heavy. My head weighs like a world and it's shedding leaves. The skin's peeling, we'll not meet again. I'm cold, I'm scared. I feel that cold, so bottomless, only the heart can gauge, that only the living hand out. The cold that's never buried, never. Felicia deploys many metaphors about women's work. There's the sewing, the mending, the cleaning, the dusting, the laundry. Your thread count seemed to make me invulnerable forever. I unravel like a ball of moth-eaten wool, my fingers scraped by ivy. The mulberry leaves and the pot-bellied silkworms curled up and the promise-filled cocoon won't do me any good. All the loose threads won't add up to a rope to hoist the rosemary scent that renews the flyaway sky. All I have left is a single strand to stitch together worlds and silences. With a cracked hand, I still write. 
a thousand letters I don't send. This idea, the difficulty of communication, appears throughout her poems. There are letters that we don't write, there are letters that we don't send, and that there are the letters that don't arrive. Today, we're connected 24 seven, thanks to social media, but I believe this isolation is still very real. And it's because it's not tech, it's human. Here's another letter poem. I wanted to write you letters of trails for a mail of getaways to talk to you in the whisper of the olive tree along the front of the afternoon. Never again with the dizziness of words jettisoned like falling bridges, but I can't. My fingers have snapped like a drying branch. If you come, you might reach me in a thousand years, not considering the trains. I shudder still. The cold of calendars frightens me. I wear now the bareness of the dying, and in my heart, the weight is resting away. It's been dumped atop the empty garden of a useless page with the scraps of me. I barely am. I can't. I wanted to tell you a word that I won't say, a word to ring out along the thousand ropes of all the eyes pulling you closed. In this final poem, it's not like things have gotten any better, but she remembers that she still has her voice. Not anymore, not anymore. I don't wear a cape to be the night bonfire or Saturday's party, not anymore. My fingernails have dropped off, graveyard crosses of basalt. I've bartered my five senses for five startles of water, five descents into hell, five frenzies of jail and cage and five continents broken down from sleigh bells and missteps. Not anymore. I don't know what's to be found in the magic wagon of any Ursa major. If I turn up there startled and with bewildered eyes, who will steer me? What track will take me through the world without pine nuts or raisins? Time is yellow, yellow the silk hand and faded. Leave me here, never again here where I'm at and now. Helpless matchstick, bring me moon for sleeping or a stake to tether my poisonous, my invincible voice. I have no edges, so leave me the sun nearby and the quiver of an iced lip melting. The frozen flower pot, the coldness of the living, is now melting because of her poisonous, invincible voice. Thank you for staying to the end. I hope you've enjoyed the wondrously strange poems of Felicia Fuste. The winter 22, well, yeah, winter 2022 issue, the special Catalan feature of Hyperion is chock full of fabulous translations. Mine are there too. May every day be San Jordi, where we celebrate words and the courage to stand up for what is right, and most importantly, the courage to stand up for each other. Thank you.